For those of you who missed our last adventure, here's a brief recap. Last time on this channel, I made a five hour deep dive into the origins of the iCarly sitcom and franchise, beginning with episode one of season one and ending with the finale of season three. Putting the workload aside, I primarily stopped there because I truly believe that the first three seasons of iCarly and the last three seasons of iCarly feel like totally different eras, and thus it's fitting to analyze them separately. If you've recently binged iCarly on Netflix, season 4 is also the first batch of episodes that they don't have. And furthermore, I think season 4 is when a lot of people fell off the show as kids, partially because it wasn't being promoted as often. So if you remember the first three seasons, or you've rewatched them recently, and you just want a recap of the rest, then this is the video for you. But if you're looking for a full recap of the entire story, I recommend checking out the iCarly playlist located on my channel, which will show you the entire saga from start to finish. And you should be able to click on that here or here right about now. Uh, unless you're watching this on a TV, in which case, what are you showing this to your mom? One last thing before we really start here, and this should be obvious, but I just want to get it out there. I will not be covering the iCarly revival in this video. And that's partially because I've not really been paying attention to it. I mean, I didn't even watch the trailer when it came out, I've logged off of all social media to avoid it, and I'm basically trying to become a hermit just to get away from spoilers relating to it. But more importantly, as I've said many times and I will continue to say, I started working on this project before they announced the revival. And in my eyes, the revival doesn't exist until we get to it. For me, the year is 2010, and a brand new season of iCarly is about to start airing. There's just an order to these things, and I kind of have a vision as per what I'm doing here, and trust me when I say when we get to the end, I think it's all going to be really, really satisfying. So if you don't want to miss the inevitable video where I do a review of the entirety of that thing that we're now going to pretend isn't real, I suggest going down, hitting subscribe, and setting the bell to all notifications. I know it's probably depressing that I keep saying this, but I really am generating a lot of motivation by the fact that, that we keep gaining subscribers, and I want to keep that momentum going. So you guys going down, hitting subscribe, it takes two seconds, and it really, really makes my day. However, I also want to quickly mention that if you really like these videos, like you really, really like these videos, and you want to guarantee that I'm able to make more, I suggest going down and subscribing to my Patreon. I've been hiring a lot of editors to do these so I can just keep writing and recording without having to stop to like edit a week's worth of footage, and I'm only able to uh, afford that because of the little support that you guys give me over on that site. Furthermore, I have just added a brand new Patreon stretch goal. If we get to 2,000 patrons, I will be doing a review of every single Garfield video game ever released. I went ahead and counted the other day, and I believe it's around 130 games? So it might be a little bit expensive, and it might take a while to get right, but if you want to support the channel and you want to help us eventually reach making that big video, then once again, consider supporting me on Patreon. Just throwing a buck or two really helps out with the cause. Anyways, let's go ahead and start off our discussion where we left off before. Seasons 2 and 3 of iCarly are actually a unique case study, because despite airing over the course of three years, both seasons were actually one continuous production block, which turned out episodes much faster than they were being released. What's notable about this is that they finished filming the season 3 finale long before it aired, about 10 months beforehand, and after they finished filming, the show took a long production break. Which meant that everyone working on the show were randomly given about 9 months off, despite it being at the peak in its popularity. Said break allowed much of the cast to seek out shorter projects during the wait. For instance, around this time was when Jeanette McCurdy filmed the cult classic wrestler film 
Fred the Movie. And McCurdy and Jerry Trainer also shot a high school video game drama titled Best Player, which wouldn't hit the airwaves for several years. Additionally, Miranda Cosgrove ended up doing voice work on a slightly more obscure film titled Despicable Me. Never heard of it. Anyways, despite all of what I've told you, the actions of the individual cast members is not the most notable thing about this specific production break. Instead, the more interesting topic is what the writers and creators of the show were up to while their most popular creation was effectively on hiatus. And the answer, apparently, was that they began working on a new show with a different cast but a very similar vibe. I'm of course talking about 2010's Victorious, which began airing during iCarly Season 3 and even tied into pre-filmed episodes in pretty clever ways. I could easily make a standalone video talking about Victorious, just breaking down the show and how it's similar to iCarly but secretly totally different in every single way. But the most notable thing about it suddenly coming into existence is that one could argue that Victorious wasn't just designed to be a sister show to iCarly, but also a replacement. You see, it came out around this time that Miranda Cosgrove was planning on taking a break from acting. Not immediately, but certainly soon. Her father had apparently requested that she go to college after high school and have the free time to attend to it properly. And this is something that she wouldn't have had time to do during the hectic production schedule of the show's first three seasons. You have to remember that these actors really were just kids, and at some point they had to start planning for their future outside of this silly teen sitcom. Victorious was designed to be the next big thing, and to also be stuck in a narrative time loop to allow it to last forever, with all of the actors on board reportedly being fully prepared for it to outlast iCarly. And because it was also a star vehicle for someone intended to be a future pop star, it's very clear at this point that iCarly was no longer the main interest of the network or the writers, despite being one of the most popular things ever made by Nickelodeon. One of the strangest side effects of all this being true is that iCarly Season 4 is easily the most normal season of the show. It has bad episodes and bad parts, but it feels bad in the same way something like Full House feels bad. It's not nearly as mean-spirited or bordering on child abuse, and that's entirely because after season 3, a good amount of the show's staff left to work on Victorious, a far worse show where their talents were arguably put to better use. I'm gonna justify that statement, okay? Just give me time, please. Another side effect of this is that starting here, every season of iCarly is exceptionally short. For the first three seasons of this show, the standard was that every season typically had around 20 to 25 episodes, but at season four, that number gets cut in half. Season four has 10 episodes, season five has nine episodes and a bloopers episode, and season six has 13 episodes one of which being this kind of weird Treehouse of Horror style episode. So altogether, discounting the Treehouse of Horror style episode and the bloopers episode, there are 31 canon episodes of iCarly remaining. For reference, season one of iCarly has 25 episodes, meaning that the first season of iCarly is nearly as long as the total of the final three seasons. So this might be a disappointingly short venture for those of you who were completely intoxicated by the absurd length of my first video, but I guess the only way to find out for sure is to go ahead and get started.
iCarly Season 4 Episode 1 aired on July the 30th, 2010, barely a month after the Season 3 finale had premiered. Although you would be excused for not remembering it that way, just because the actor suddenly aging a year between stories is certainly kind of distracting. And speaking of aging, the plot of this episode is that Carly is celebrating her birthday, which I believe means that she's 16 or maybe 17, but I'm pretty sure 16. Anyways, the gang get together and throw her a surprise party with all of her friends and loved ones. Freddy, Sam, Spencer, Gibby, that guy from the smoothie shop. Like the fully adult man who came to her 16th birthday party, that's normal. Carly notes that this is a lot better than her last birthday, which Spencer apparently royally screwed over by taking her to a petting zoo, where a goat- Don't talk about what the goat did! Long story short, Spencer is apparently committed to getting things right this time, and does so by making a gummy bear themed lamp for Carly, which she asks Gibby to take up to her room and plug in as a surprise. And you know, the crazy thing is, 65 episodes in, we still haven't seen Carly's room. Which is weird because they mention it constantly, and obviously it's an essential part of her life, it's where she spends most of her time off screen. And that's one of the reasons that this episode was so hyped up. Because this is the first episode in the entire iCarly series where we finally get to see what Carly's room looks like. And I thought I lived in a squalor. Yes, Spencer's well-intentioned birthday present has caught fire to Carly's room, destroying everything she holds dear. I, I bet what that goat did to you last year doesn't seem so bad anymore. <laughs> what did the goat do? Spencer as an insurance representative look at everything destroyed in the fire and is shocked to learn that an antique watch gifted to them by their great grandmother is so valuable that he is immediately given a check for $82,000. He intends to use said money to build Carly a brand new room, but sends her off to get a job at the Groovy Smoothie to build the expectation that they're out of money to help repair her room. That night, Spencer has a dozen people over to speed build her a new bedroom, while Carly emotionally struggles over at her new job. Come on, Carly! So your room burned down. Look at the bright side. What's the bright side? Anyway. Carly comes home defeated, underpaid, and depressed, but is reluctantly dragged upstairs by Spencer as he shows her the new room which they have built for her. Truly, one of the coolest living spaces you could ask for as a teenager, all funded by the $82,000 that they were given by insurance. Spencer spent it all on your room. The whole lot, baby! Which is so stupid because we rent this place, but who cares? <laughs> so yeah, they all celebrate the coolness of this new room, Gibby says some funny stuff, and the episode concludes to a credit scene of the cast singing the Victorious song to try and get you to watch that show instead. This episode sets into play some core new elements of the show from here on out. First of all, Carly's room is quickly going to become a core centerpiece to the show's storytelling. While previously, the gang would basically only be portrayed hanging out on the iCarly set like that is Carly's bedroom, from here on out this room becomes a lounge of sorts where the characters spend a good amount of time together. However, a lot more notable is the episode's treatment of Gibby and Tebow. While previously both had been well-loved supporting characters, from here on out they both get promotions of sort. Gibby, from here on, is billed consistently as one of the show's main characters, and episodes without him are going to become increasingly rare, and Tebow follows up right behind him, despite how rarely it makes sense that this weird older adult is so emphatic about hanging out with a 16 year old. The point is that from this point forward, you could argue that the show has gone from struggling to juggle four leads to a new total of six. 
And with the remaining episodes being so few and far between, I do remember being annoyed as a teenager that the show was continuously losing focus, and I wonder if I'll agree with my former opinion as I keep going further. I do know one thing for sure, it'll be a cold day in hell before I get tired of seeing Tebow. Hey, what can I get you little ladies today? Do you sell smoothies? Do I? What? Season 4 episode 2 is a special episode because it features a celebrity guest cameo and also a reveal of a lore character who we've never actually seen before. Jane Lynch, of Glee fame, appearing in the role of Sam's previously unseen mother. In the episode, Sam has yet another series of massive fights with her mother, eventually causing her to suddenly move out and begin living in the Shea household. However, Carly finds it impossible to put up with Sam, mostly because of her obsessive eating, which leaves their apartment rife with uneaten food. And in the heat of the moment, wanting to make things right, she invites Sam's mother over so the two can patch things up. Carly, you got my mother- You guys to have to make up. I don't want any part of her. You don't deserve my parts. This episode makes me uncomfortable, and in a way that I guess I couldn't ascertain as a teenager, but is very clear to me as an adult. I think the issue at hand is that Sam's mother, by basic definition of everything we know about her character, is an abusive person. She is abusive to Sam, and that has caused Sam to have massive issues in her personality, which causes her to then be abusive to people in her life as well. And I understand that the pretense of dealing with this kind of thing as a teenager is that if you leave your parents, you become homeless. But Sam does not owe her mother anything. No child who is abused by their parents owes said parents anything. And I just find the overarching narrative of this one, that Sam and her mother must make up because they're mother and daughter, to be a particularly limited take that is extremely unsatisfying. And furthermore, the more that they try and play it for comedy, the more tone deaf it comes across. Like, haha, Sam grew up without a loving home. Haha, Sam's mother is physically abusive, causing her to act out in fits of violence. That's so fucking funny. Carly becomes so worried about the pair that she takes them to family therapy. But the therapist has apparently never experienced dysfunction before and is at a complete and total loss. Brief pause here. I just want to mention something really quick. Something, you know, one really... A uh, tiny thing about this episode. Um, it's funny when you watch a show like this and, and you actually um, t find yourself getting invested and you take note of the sort of consistent lore and continuity. And then they shuffle writers a little and they make one continuity mistake that still bothers you a lot. Case in point, this piece of dialogue, which happens 15 minutes into the episode, when Sam and her mother are at this therapist's office together. You two need to spend some time in the therapy box. It's a new kind of therapy that's a bit unorthodox. Well, that's cool. We're not Jewish. <laughs> yes, you are. Sam. Sam, look at me, Sam. Look at me. You are Jewish. You have mentioned this numerous times. You had a bad mitzvah. You have a Star of David in your locker at school. You are Jewish. How did she forget that she's Jewish? This comment section is going to be filled with people being like, well, what if Sam was just lying about her religion? Yeah, well, what if she was huffing paint thinner? Anyways, so this therapist decides that he wants to try out a new experimental form of therapy. He locks the pair in solitary confinement. And that's it. He locks them in a closet and begins crying. Your friends are insane. Yes, yes they are. You are a therapist. Is this your first day on the job? Carly gets locked in the box and the therapist won't let her out either. Soon enough, we learn that Carly is deathly claustrophobic and begins having an intense episode. What's wrong? I can't help but notice that she's making goat noises. Is that a coincidence or does she have claustrophobia 
because of the encounter she had with that goat. I don't know, this episode sucks. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, the groovy smoothie is suddenly attacked by a hammer-wielding bandit, who strikes the store before fleeing in a flash. We soon learn that all the security cameras in the area are busted, as the criminal is infamous for sneaking in beforehand and disabling all of the security cameras in the area. Somehow. However, during the robbery, Freddy is seen testing out a pair of glasses with a hidden camera and manages to film the culprit in the act. In the resulting chaos of him being the first person to ever capture film of this violent hammer bandit, Freddy's full name and address are stated live over the air, leading him to become a paranoid mess as he frets that Maxwell might soon come after him for violent revenge. In the end, Spencer manages to trick the bandit by swapping Freddy's apartment number with another resident down the hall, which somehow works, as the criminal is fully fooled by the tactic. As a kid, I remember this part of the episode being really, really frustrating. Because they present this dude as one of the most stealthy, intelligent criminals in the Seattle area, and also as someone who relies on hitting things with hammers for the second half of his plan. And also as someone who is incapable of noticing when a simple plate switcheroo has been orchestrated in front of him. And also that the police are still incapable of identifying him at this point when he's a pretty outlandish looking dude. Anyways, let's move on to Season 4, Episode 3, I Get Pranky. In the episode, Sam and Freddy are talking about the best pranks they've ever played on people. And Carly admits something. She has never played a prank on someone outside of the iCarly web show. I'm sure it'll happen. <laughs> when I, you know, meet the right person. The group decide that they have to get Carly to lose her prank genity, but her pranks are consistently terrible and fail to elicit any negative response from her victims. This is until Spencer tells her a story of how when he was in the ninth grade, he was once known as the Prank King, until things got too far and he accidentally injured several of his classmates by getting garlic powder in their eyes. It's supposed to be funny! It was just a prank! Carly hears the story, but all she takes away from it is that Spencer can teach her how to do good pranks. Spencer insists that he's quit the game, but after a round of puppy dog eyes, he eventually relents. Shortly thereafter, Carly texts Sam and Freddy and tells them to come to the iCarly studio. There they see a dish tray and a note which claims to be from Neville, telling them that he's left them a treat. That treat seems to be the decapitated head of Carly, before she reveals that it was just a prank bro. After this, we quickly learn that Spencer is now once again addicted to pranks. Carly tries to get him to stop, but he doesn't, and he pranks more people. He gets beat up, he decides not to prank people anymore, this episode is all B-plot, I remember this being a very common thing from here on out. Okay, so there is one part of this episode that actually is super notable, perhaps the most notable thing in the entire season. There's a scene around the middle of the episode where the characters tell Gibby to climb a ladder and then jump from the ceiling, and sure enough, he goes ahead and does that. Wait, we forgot Gibby. Oh yeah. Gibby! Gibby! <laughs> Now for quite a while, this has gone around as kind of a viral meme, often under the title Gibby Dies, entirely exploiting the fact that that fall really looks like it hurt. But a few years ago, um, the actor that played Gibby uh, revealed that it was all stunt work, it was done by a stunt actor, but that it wasn't acting because it really did hurt because that stunt actor was seriously injured in that clip. There's that meme where I fall and die, that fucking <laughs> Gibby dies. He hits the floor really hard, it's funny. But yeah, that stunt was, was that guy like broke all his ribs or something? <laughs> <laughs> I'm supposed to fall from the ceiling and just hit the ground and get the wind knocked out of me. But dude, that guy hit that fucking ground. <laughs> Wait, he was actually just assassinate you. Yeah, in the script, he was actually supposed to just fall onto the ground with no safety or anything. <laughs> <laughs> no safety yet. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna someone. highly fucking recommend that anyone curious check out the clip on YouTube. This is a brutal fucking stunt fall. Yeah. Holy it's shit. Fucking bad. 
Uh, he got like actually hurt, and yet did you have to stop the show because of it or the recording? I think, I think, yeah, I think he got I, carried off. We we stopped filming. I think that's incredible. Where you get this take of the man literally killing himself, and that's the one that ends up in the show. That's I, amazing. I, if I remember correctly, he was not doing too that's well. Some, like that was scary. The WWE fuck. doesn't even go that far for realism. The most telling part of this sequence to me is um, the reaction that the actors give to this dude just hitting the floor. Everyone stiffens up, and uh, uh, Nathan Cress specifically makes this face that I don't think he could have acted. Just like this honest, agape look at seeing this man die in front of him. One thing people don't talk about with this scene is um, this stuntman allegedly fell uh, into an unsafe, unpadded environment and broke a bunch of his ribs. And when they shot the pickup material, uh, I presume a few days later, when they shot that pickup material, they wrote in a joke where Gibby mentions that he broke his ribs. Did you guys hear my ribs crack? And it's like, I'm just trying to imagine the people who made this show sending someone to the hospital and knowing that their actions directly led to someone being seriously hurt and, and sent to the emergency room. And then kind of just going, well, we're ambivalent to this. Speaking of ambivalence, we're going to skip episode 4 for now because it contains a crime and easily one of the worst things that the cast have done so far. So let's move on to season 4 episode 5, The Boring Wedding One. A fan sends in a V-mail saying that they want to propose to their girlfriend live on iCarly. He does so, and she says yes, and all of the iCarly gang are invited to their wedding, with Carly and Sam being the bridesmaids and Freddy being the best man, causing conflict with the groom's brother, who is angry that he was not picked to be the best man. Just watch your back, internet boy. However, the wedding is suddenly broken off when the bride declares that she has fallen in love with Spencer, someone who has stood in the same room as her for barely an hour at this point. And honestly, babe, I can't blame you. And boy, this one, uh, it keeps going for sure. They, they just kept filming it. It wasn't my choice. How do you like me grabbing your lip? I don't. I know. Carly tries to get the groom to sing a romantic song he wrote about his fiance, but he's so embarrassed that he pisses himself in front of all of their friends and family. But Carly sings the song herself and saves the wedding. Buy the Miranda Cosgrove album, now available for $29.99. Anyways, I, I love this season because it's all boring. All these episodes are boring, but they don't make me feel bad, which is an improvement. We're halfway done with the season, by the way. Season 4, episode 6 should be a bit of a salvation for us, because it's the first real event episode of the season. And furthermore, it's one of the last episodes in the show's run, which is unambiguously about an element of influencer culture which hasn't really been properly explored yet. That being, web creator conventions, and the ways that audience members can interact with creators at said events. I'm of course talking about the classic two-part episode, I Start a Fan War. At the start of this episode, Carly is at school and ends up crushing on a specific generic boy toy who she sees in the hall. Freddy, showing off his slowly developed sense of maturity, actually flaunts no signs of insecurity about this, nearly encouraging Carly to go after him if she really likes him. Later that week, Carly is contacted by said boy, who kicks off the conversation by asking about the iCarly ships. As we discover in the episode, audiences watching the iCarly web show have developed a shipping culture identical to that of the real world, leaving many fans speculating on who Freddy should end up with, with many people online presuming that Carly and Freddy have been boyfriend-girlfriend for several years. Carly dissuades this idea and responds emphatically when Adam asks her her out on a date that Saturday. But in the end, she has to turn him down, because that Saturday is the annual Webicon, a convention she was supposed to go to the year prior before she was kidnapped by an obsessive fan. The dialogue in this episode directly states that the end of season 3 was a year ago for the iCarly gang, matching the production schedule of the episodes, but not the broadcast order. As in the real world, iPsycho aired barely five months before the episode in question. 
And so, that Saturday, the gang all make it to the convention, but are overwhelmed at just how popular they are with the Webicon attendees, as Freddy is, at one point, grabbed by fangirls and nearly torn to shreds, before going back in for seconds once he realizes how rarely he feels the touch of a woman. Later on during the convention, the official iCarly panel is held, and the room is packed full of ecstatic fans of the web show from all corners of the globe. And as we learn, the entire room has been split into two warring factions. Freddie and I aren't in a romantic relationship. Respectfully, I disagree. Shut up! <laughs> This is made worse by the fact that Adam, the boy that Carly likes from school, has also decided to attend the panel, and runs out of the room as he's also convinced by the crowd that Carly and Freddy are secretly in love and destined to be together. Something that they both deny, but Sam encourages for the hell of it. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, Spencer gets into a steam feud with special guest star Jack Black, which ends with the two having an epic battle of wits, and then weapons. Wrist balls! Meanwhile, meanwhile, in the C-plot, Gibby tries to get to the convention, but his grandfather is blind, and they get stuck at Inside Out Burger. Back in the A-plot, Sam brings Carly's swoon back in, tied up to keep him from leaving, and tells the audience that Carly and Freddy aren't actually dating, causing the crowd to presume that Sam and Freddy are dating instead, igniting a riot between the two factions, with things culminating when Carly is almost Geraldo rivera -ed. However, Sam is eventually able to calm the crowd down, and Carly gives an ultimate speech about how iCarly was never about the shipping culture. iCarly is not really about our romantic relationships. iCarly is about comedy. Carly casually mentions that the boy in the front row, tied up, is the only person she wants to date, causing the crowd to physically assault him as a mob, causing Carly to roll her eyes, walk away, and presumably leave another ex-boyfriend to be sent to the ICU. Yeah, poor Adam. Well, let's go. You see, guys, this is what iCarly is about. Avoiding the repercussions of your actions. I Start a Fan War is one of the final episodes in the show's run dedicated to studying unique aspects of internet culture. In this case, the phenomenon of people shipping real-world people with each other as if they're cartoon characters and not real human beings. However, in a much larger way, we have to recognize that that's not what this episode is about at all. In reality, I Start a Fan War is an anti-subtle criticism of the iCarly fandom itself, essentially telling the viewers at home that they enjoy iCarly for the wrong reasons. I've been told the creator of the show at the time would often use his internet blog to vent about shipping culture in his shows, and this episode was most likely a way for him to try and dissuade audiences away from topics like that. Which is kind of weird because most of season 3 was dedicated to fanning the flames of the shipping wars. Even this episode itself was promoted as if it was an episode which was explicitly romantic, which obviously wasn't the case. This is certainly an episode that I remember watching at the time, um, but I also think it was the first episode I ever saw that made me kind of realize that I Carly was going to take a, a bit of a dip in quality. Um, I actually remember right after I finished this, I had this, this awful gut feeling that we were going to get to the finale and Freddy wasn't going to end up with anybody. You know what I mean? And, and today that sounds like a dumb thing to complain about, but I mean, this was five years, a five year story arc that Nickelodeon got an entire generation hooked on. And the answer that, that they came up with was that you were a loser if you cared what was going to happen. But I think another oncoming fault line that this episode set up is that iCarly started out as a sitcom about a group of fictional teenagers who become internet famous within their universe and the repercussions of that happening to them. However, by this point in the series, iCarly had become such a big show that it pivoted to being a meta-contextual commentary on its own existence as a cultural phenomenon. So they're starting to kind of phase out the well-thought-out and intelligent storylines about internet culture, and they're replacing all of that 
with jokes where the characters know that they're in a sitcom. Happy birthday! What is that, your catchphrase? In other words, the show has bought into its own hype in a way that I find to be personally pretty annoying. And the more we continue past this, the more the writers are going to spin out, and the more it's going to feel like they absolutely despise the reasons that kids were watching at home. Anyways, let's dive deeper into the filler as we look at Season 4, Episode 7, I Hire an Idiot. Let's get through this one fast, it barely deserves mention. The iCarly gang are tired of working on the web show and decide to hire an intern. However, Carly and Sam decide to hire a dude who's 2010 hot despite him being a complete and total idiot. Said himbo continues to mess the show up, but Carly and Sam are so transfixed by his raw sexuality that they refuse to fire him. In retaliation, Freddy hires a female version of this, which the girls decry as offensive, but Freddy says he will only fire his hot idiot if they fire theirs. I'll fire my feminine idiot when you fire your himbosome! <laughs> Eventually, after the female intern steals a baby and the male intern eats a bunch of raw meat, the group finally agree to fire all of the interns. Oh, and then the girl is actually smart, but I guess she really did kidnap that baby. Anyways, I know I just said that the fan convention episode is one of the final episodes about internet culture in a major way, but there is actually one other episode in Season 4 which substantially discusses a phenomenon which has become a major thing online in the last few years. I'm talking about Season 4, Episode 8, I Pity the Neville, which features the return of Neville Papperman and the repercussions of his mass public shaming. So the plot of this one is all about the phenomenon of Karens. Viral clips of human beings being absolutely god-awful people and then becoming the fascination of a very bored and very angry planet. In the story, Neville is randomly caught on video yelling at a girl for bumping into him at the store, causing her to begin crying as his anger only grows. Anyways, this viral clip receives millions of views on Splashface, and his life is ruined overnight, causing all of the gang to celebrate as they rightfully should. They then record the new episode of iCarly, which features a cutaway skit where Freddy is dressed up like a sexy vampire. This skit really isn't that funny on a surface level, but the on-point visuals are so goddamn surreal that I'm trying to find all of the words in the world to describe this, just so I can continue to show you visual examples of Freddy dressed up like Robert Pattinson. You guys seen any good TV shows recently? I haven't. The gang throw what they designate a karma party, a party celebrating that the life of their arch nemesis has fallen to pieces exclusively due to his own actions. There, Freddy discovers that girls in Seattle are obsessed with his performance in the skit, swooning over him, but only when he does the Twilight voice. I edited that whole movie with some new software I just got. Cutting room flow. Yeah. Uh-huh, that was it. Seriously. Meanwhile, Neville's whole life has fallen to pieces, as everyone he runs into treats him poorly because they've all seen the viral clip of him being cruel. Tortured by this, Neville becomes consumed with an ongoing flood of self-loathing and self-hatred, even losing track of his ambitions for revenge and rue. Neville goes to the iCarly gang and tries to convince them to allow him to use the iCarly platform to show that he has regret for his actions. Sam says they'll do it, but only if Neville drinks punch from her dirty sneaker, which she's been using for over a year. He goes through with this, and they agree to help him, filming an apology video where he gives out free smoothies and bags of creamed corn. Of course, this goes over terribly, as the internet in mass sees through Neville's desperate attempt to find a way out of his mistakes and then go after the iCarly gang for colluding with him. There's this really weird joke at this point where Spencer is, like, mad that he doesn't have a B-plot in this one. Like, overtly the joke is that Spencer is angry that he doesn't have enough scenes in the episode. And I don't know, I like me some fourth wall jokes, but at this point it feels like iCarly does this every other episode, and it's just lazy. 
the iCarly gang have Neville do a live apology video on the web show, and they even bring out the little girl in an emotional moment which goes equally viral. Neville honestly thanks the gang for helping him turn his life around and doesn't reveal any sort of secret scheme connected to the events of the story, before he bumps into a man in a wheelchair and again has another Karen freakout moment, which once again goes completely viral. This leads us to Season 1, Episode 9, I-O-M-G, which is, in my mind, the true finale for the season, as it leads directly into the main story arc of Season 5, casually skipping over the actual finale, which had yet to air at this point. I am very surprised I never saw this one as a kid, because I certainly would have gotten really excited over it, even if as an adult this episode is kind of… really weird? Let's break this one down. In the story, we learn that Ridgeway has an annual tradition wherein the student body are locked in the building overnight, and forced to work on various science experiments. The school recently has had a new transfer in a guy named Brad, who actually applied to be an intern on iCarly several episodes earlier, and Freddy and him begin working on a phone app for their school presentation. The app is designed to scan the faces of whoever uses it to identify the mood of the person in question. Sam, when hearing this pitch, decides she wants to join in, as she begins spending copious time with the two boys. On the day of the lockdown, Freddy scans Sam's face as part of the experiment, only for it to identify her mood as being in love. He shares this information with Carly, and they both come to the exact same conclusion about all of the clues laid out before them. Sam is in love with What's-His-Face. Speaking of which, can we just stop for a moment here and talk about Carly's project, because it's one of the weirdest things in the show so far. Her experiment involves inviting her brother to the school and locking him in a soundproof box which he cannot see or hear out of. She then selectively tortures him with different stimuli while he's locked inside, playing loud pop music he hates, filling the box with a stinky gas, and then starving him until he's begging for food. At which point she says that he can only eat if he has a blindfold on, as it turns out that she's attached electrical wires to the metal dish, and she electrocutes him as he begins eating. Maybe we need to revisit that fan theory that Carly is secretly Megan. I don't know what the fuck this B-plot is about, they never give it a conclusion, so like all we can potentially gather is maybe Carly is trying to give herself therapy by reenacting traumatic situations, you know, like the Nora incident, but more likely she just wanted to hook a car battery up to her brother's nuts, that's all we can gather. Anyways, Carly tells Sam about the app saying she's in love, and Sam acts embarrassed and angry, saying that the app was just wrong. Carly tries very hard to get Sam and Brad to hook up, telling her that she deserves to be happy and find someone that she's happy with. Sam gets into a massive fight with Carly over this, and ends up sulking in the school courtyard at which point Freddy approaches her and tries to give her a pep talk. Freddy says that Carly is right about everything, and that Sam does deserve to be happy, and that she shouldn't be afraid to share her emotions, especially with a guy that she secretly likes, because she never knows how that guy will react or how things will go, at which point Sam kisses Freddy. And this is where we end Season 4 with Sam and Freddy realizing that they might honestly have a shot at a real relationship. Or at least, that's kind of how the season ends. Because directly after this episode, Season 4, Episode 10 aired, a mega crossover with the show Victorious, which was aired outside of its logical chronological order, as it's supposed to be set before Episode 8, which is itself set before Episode 7. I Party with Victorious is the longest episode in the show's run, being the length of three episodes instead of the regular two, and it's easily the worst episode of season four, and we're gonna skip it for now. With that, let's move on to the iCrimes recap of the season. For those of you who missed the first video, I have been keeping track of every crime that the gang commits in the show, and I've been ranking them at the end of every season as kind of a fun little side thing. You'll catch on, don't worry. Okay, starting us off is the first crime of this video and our iCrime number 33, Child Endangerment. 
but not of the attempted variety. At the start of Season 4, Episode 1, when Carly announces that her birthday is coming up soon, Spencer enters with a giant pie, which Gibby breaks out of for a visual gag. Gibby exclaims that he couldn't breathe inside of the pie, with Spencer saying that he told him to breathe through the tube. At which point the Gibster responds, I couldn't find the tube! Oh, I forgot the tube. It's so easy to forget while you're watching the show, but Gibby, Carly, Sam, and Freddy are all literal children. And Spencer is an adult, and when he does something like almost kill Gibby by baking him into a pie, you remember that this is a very not good thing for him to be doing. Anyways, for our next crime, we're going to be getting in kind of a gray area, I guess, and that involves the question, are Gibby and Tebow main characters themselves? They certainly appear constantly and are often billed as the show's leads. So when they commit a crime, is that worth pointing out, even when it's a crime done to one of the actual main characters? Let's just roll the die and say the answer is yes. Anyways, in episode 1, as you'll remember, Carly briefly gets a job working at the Groovy Smoothie. However, she's shocked to discover that the Groovy Smoothie has a policy of dissuading its workers from washing their hands. And apparently, the pay is absurdly low. When Carly gets home, she reports that she has worked 12 hours straight and was barely paid enough to afford a single can of paint for her bedroom. First of all, Tebow is clearly violating Washington's strict child labor laws, which clearly state that a 16 to 17 year old should only be able to work eight hours in any given day. And second, based on Carly's estimate that she, quote, barely made enough for a single can of paint, let's go ahead and presume that she made about $45 on the pricey end of that estimate. If that is the case, then Carly was paid $3.75 an hour, far below the $8.55 which was the minimum wage for Seattle in 2010. Now, if Carly had been 14 to 15 in 2010, then she would have qualified for a slightly diminished minimum wage, a minimum of around $7.20 an hour. But as we've established, basic continuity within the show easily makes it that she has to be 16 to 17 at this point, and thus qualifies for the full $8.55 pay rate. I can easily say, based on my studying of Washington law, that Tebow in this case has easily violated three very explicit and well-known Washington rules and regulations by not enforcing the washing of hands, overworking minors, and underpaying staff. And thus, I'm going to go ahead and call those I crimes number 34, 35, and 36. And our next crime, by coincidence, is also a violation of child labor laws. In Season 1, Episode 4, the gang realized that people want to buy their terrible designer penny t-shirts, and they begin selling them online. However, Sam eventually flakes for a few days, and when she comes back, she has over a hundred shirts made from scratch, causing her friends to ask where she could have possibly gotten these so easily. You wanna know how I made so many penny tees? Check it out. Yes, this isn't a dream sequence or anything. Sam has made a sweatshop where the workers are fourth graders and she pays them $5 a day. You'll also recognize this room as the one where that dude fell and broke all his ribs. Truly cursed ground. I don't know what you guys want me to add to this one. Like here, I googled if sweatshops are illegal. Google says yes. Uh, details about the sweatshop, right. Um, there's a scene where this little girl has a cut and Sam puts duct tape on her arm. There's a scene where we learn that the food they're served at the sweatshop was found in a dumpster and has garbage in the food. There's a scene where Sam yells at someone for drinking water on the clock. She ends up feeding them processed meat in a can that's intended to be fed to horses. That's funny. Please laugh at the joke. Carly and Freddy decide to take half of the sweatshop upstairs and try to make a more fun, light-hearted sweatshop. But it turns out that the kids don't make the shirts too fast when their human rights aren't being violated. And long story short, all of the kids end up quitting, start their own penny tea business, and drive the gang out of business. And the group all learn an important lesson. You would hope. <laughs> 
Next is eye crime number 38. In the B-plot of the wedding episode, Gibby sees a $5 bill in a tree and tries to go get it. He stops an elderly woman on the street, basically hitting on her, and asks for her help in exchange for the two going and getting coffee. Eventually, he is able to get the bill, but when he falls over, he accidentally knocks the woman out. He then flees the scene, taking Guppy and his money with him. Gibby killed an old lady. Moving on to eye crime number 39. In season one, episode six, Carly's prospective boyfriend leaves the convention after believing that Carly and Freddy are an item. Sam finds him trying to get on a shuttle bus, ties him up with electrical wire, and forces him back into the convention room. You see this? This is kidnapping. Very different from false imprisonment, and also our eye crime number 40. In the B-plot of episode 7, Spencer explains that when he quit law school several years earlier, he made a promise to his grandfather that if he didn't have an art piece in a Seattle museum within three years, he would return to college. Spencer, surprisingly, doesn't have any art in any museum. Which is potentially because he hasn't made a sculpture in a long time. So he decides to sneak into a renowned Seattle museum and puts up an art piece without permission. That being the sculpture he made in the pilot, because again, he doesn't make sculptures anymore apparently. He gets caught doing this once and is thrown out, but sneaks in a second time and manages to pull it off. And what you can imagine must be breaking and entering. When he nearly gets kicked out again, he begins making out with the woman trying to throw him out, which is an act of sexual assault. She's really, really into it, but you know what? I'm counting it anyway, so that's eye crimes number 41 and 42. Now, you'll remember that earlier in this video, I said I was saving I Party with Victorious for later. Well, you might be surprised to find out that said later period isn't right now. We are going to properly cover this episode a little bit down the road. For now, all you need to know about this episode is that Gibby goes to a party undercover, someone recognizes him from iCarly, and he punches the person, knocking them out and dragging them into another room. That's iCrime number 43 and the end of our Season 4 discussions. These are taking a lot less time to do these days, aren't they? I'm balancing on a bunch of pillows because I really like the shot, but I don't, it's this, this couch will just like suck you into it. And it's like, well, I gotta look like I'm standing up. <laughs> Season four is an odd beast. I would hesitate in calling it truly bad, but there are cracks in the foundation that we're starting to see here that are only going to get worse as we continue into season five and then season six. Incidentally, it is now time for us to do our penultimate mid-season intermission. So for those of you who are watching this video without the last one, I started this tradition in the first iCarly video where in between every season I would kind of step to the side and talk about stuff that is interesting to me but doesn't really fit into the main series analysis. And the purpose behind this is to kind of build a separation between the info that I'm giving to you so you sort of understand which information came from which season and you start to take it in like like people would have when they were kids. And arguably, there hasn't been a time more fitting for an intermission than right now, because the season four cliffhanger was the show's first real hiatus, where you had to wait a significant amount of time to see what would happen next. I imagine half of you right now are kind of going, yes, the cliffhanger, what happens next? And then the other half of you are like, wait, wait, what, what cliffhanger? Because the moment that I mentioned the child sweatshop, Sam and Freddy kissing was just wiped from your mind. Like to, like, to be fair, Sam and Freddy have kissed before, okay? But they ain't never opened a child sweatshop together before. So, you know, hashtag relationship goals. So for this intermission, I don't have a lot of like consistent content to give you guys, to be honest. So I thought we'd just kind of circle back around to a few topics that we haven't, you know, properly covered before. You know, you guys might've noticed this. I, uh, I got a little uh, haircut this week and you know, I'm thinking right now if that pandemic can just lighten its load a little, I'm ready to get out there, you know? I'm ready to see the sights, meet the people, have some adventures. And you know, if I'm gonna be out there, if I'm gonna be doing that, then I think I'm gonna need the iCarly perfume 
and the iCarly Cologne. These are entirely real. I did not make these up. You could go out and buy these a decade ago. I don't know where. I don't know who would have sold these. But clearly someone did because you can really easily find them on eBay. Yeah, so this is this is Click. This is the iCarly perfume. It comes in this little bottle and um, there's Carly on the, the side of the bottle there. And then of course over here we have the iCarly cologne. That's a little more basic uh, visually. The first thing I thought of when I saw these was like the love story that could happen here. Two people walking down the street, not even looking up from their shoes. They pass each other and then they just stop. And they turn and they just stare at each other in disbelief. Are you wearing the iCarly perfume? Yes. Are you wearing the iCarly cologne? Yes! I mean, I can't imagine anything more romantic. This is a bad time to tell you guys that I have mild anosmia. I swear to God, it just smells like soap and hand sanitizer. That's all I'm picking up. I don't know why, but I presumed that when you put on the iCarly cologne, it somehow makes you think about the internet. But, in a way, I think it would have to smell pretty bad to make you think of the internet. Okay, next is the iCarly perfume. A lot more boost in that one. A lot easier to spray. This makes me think of a public restroom at a, at a pool. Like a restroom at a public pool. Not inside the restroom, like directly outside the restroom, right? So I'm gonna recap these for you. The iCarly cologne smells like rubbing alcohol. The iCarly perfume smells like a swimming pool. <laughs> okay, so uh, the next thing we want to move on to real quick now that we've got that complete boredom out of the way is I wanted to circle back around to the McDonald's uh, iCarly Happy Meals. Hey everyone! Today we're going to be listening to... Jenny's Stomach! <laughs> the stomach has spoken. Happy meal time! You can create your own wackiness with an iCarly toy in your McDonald's Happy Meal. There were two of these, one in 2010 and one in 2011, and there were a lot of toys released inside. So what I ended up doing is, I bought a big plastic bag <laughs> on eBay that's just filled with these toys, most of them unopened, okay? It's a little stoplight. I don't know why this was in an iCarly Happy Meal set and not a Mr. Rogers Happy Meal set or whatever, but I mean, that's the thing. Is there a stoplight on the iCarly set? I don't know if there is. Next we got this right here. I'll go ahead and open this. This is a visual representation of the car seat that Carly has in her uh, in her home there. And it's got a little, a little weird toaster thing. What does this say? Oh, it says random dancing. So it's like, oh, there they are sitting in their car, right? They're sitting in their car and look, oh, now they're now they got a random, random dance. A lot of this stuff is based around like, um, Kind of the stuff that Carly has around her apartment. Like this is a little gummy bear and inside are like some stickers and a pencil that I just dropped. Like to be honest with you, if I was a kid and I saw this, I would never think I Carly. Cause I know they have like a bunch of these dogs on their set. It just doesn't read I Carly to me. Like what is just a dog? One of the things in this set is like a, a little gumball Tom Servo head. And even as an adult, I don't know what this has to do with iCarly. I know there's a little piece of paper here. Pull that out, what happens? Oh my god, look at that. Here's what it has to do with iCarly. It's a bunch of stickers on a roll. And when you pull Tom Servo's tongue out, uh, you can pull off some of these stickers. You see that? This is of course like the, the, the thing that I think you had to go and get these this McDonald's set for, and that's Baby Spencer. I mean, Baby Spencer, this is actually the only Spencer toy they ever made, I think. And I th <laughs> the, great, the great thing about this is there's this little hole at the top, and I think the idea is you can put your own face into the Baby Spencer toy and make your own baby version of yourself. McDonald's really was a gamble, though, because, I mean, sometimes you just get like this. Like some jump. What is this? What is this? Okay. So turn it on. I don't know. This probably did something a decade ago. As some final things, we got a little mouse pad and a magic meatball toy. Uh, this, I believe, used to do stuff, but I, I imagine it doesn't work. I've, I bought a few of these and none of them worked. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't work. And, uh, yeah. Uh, that's it.
I know I might seem really bummed, you know, right about here. And, and that's because that's because I am. Because it's really weird to work on a project like this for so long. And then to realize that you're like so close to just wrapping it up. You know, I mean, because after this, this is the next to last intermission. So after this, it's it's a season, then a final intermission, and then a season, and then we're done. And I guess I'm just kind of bummed because, I mean, this is, this is it. And, and I just couldn't think of any other iCarly eccentricities to tell you guys about. So I bought Freddy's camera. You, you guys want to talk about that for a second? This is the Canon XL1. I'm not sure quite what year it came out, but the most important thing about this model of camera is that for the entirety of the original run of iCarly, this was the prop that Freddy used when he was filming his webcast. Now, immediately, there's going to be two things that you're going to recognize are missing from this certain prop. The first thing is the microphone. There's a little microphone holder right here, and on Freddy's camera and most XL1s, there's typically like a microphone that connects up to the camera right here. Uh, I thought about buying one. It would not have been difficult, but the thing is, that's entirely an aesthetics thing. I'm not actually going to be, you know, using a microphone with this camera. So I figured it probably just wasn't worth the hassle or the money. And now the second thing that's uh, missing is what I call the glow stick. On the back of Freddy's camera right here, there is a little cylindrical light. And inside the iCarly universe, that is supposed to basically represent... Uh, Freddy's Bluetooth technology that he uses. That is what makes the camera wireless. And let me establish a cross-duplex transmission between my laptop and my camera. Wow, a tech talking witch boy. You'll take note as a comparison that when Freddy is using the camera at the start of the pilot, that light is missing, and that's because he properly has it hooked up, and thus he doesn't need a wireless connection. But for the rest of the series, he uses this handheld, and thus he has, you know, that technology on board, so it can just be something he kind of walks around the room with. I have so much I want to tell you guys about this camera. I have so many things to say about it, but there is one specific thing, okay? There is one specific thing that I feel like is the perfect thing to go ahead and break the ice. Okay, so here it is. Have you ever noticed that Freddy's camera has a little silver box right here? Okay. Have you ever wondered what that is? It's a tape deck. Freddy's camera runs on cassettes. Now don't you feel like your whole life has been a lie? Despite the fact that iCarly tries to get you to subconsciously believe that this is some extremely advanced piece of HD technology, this camera is the kind of thing you would find in the media room of an underfunded high school. I mean, to be honest with you, this thing is basically one step above a VHS camera, and I'm being very kind when I say that. I'm just really, really amused by the idea of them bringing this in on like when they were making the show and someone being like, you can't have that be the camera they're using to shoot their HD web show. And then someone else is like, chill, 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 dude. We're gonna, we're gonna stick a glow stick on the back and every kid at home will think this is some shit from the future. I bought this on eBay and I get it and I'm like, they didn't clean it before they sent it to me because I pick it up and it's just like, it's so sticky and dirty. So, you know, I get a bunch of cleaning materials and I clean this thing off and there's so much dirt coming off this thing. You wouldn't believe. I mean, my paper towels are just turning black. And so I clean it and I clean it and I clean it and I go, it's good to have that over with. I pick it up. It's still sticky. It's sticky right now. What I realized, this thing isn't dirty, it's disintegrating. Like, I don't know what material this is, I, I'm really bad at identifying materials, but it seems like some kind of like weird rubber, and it's just not lasted at all through the ages, so... Uh, to touch, this thing is just coming off on my hands. This camera is becoming one with my DNA, it is just... Sometimes it is hard to rip my hand off of it because... Because the materials are just deteriorating and becoming this like 
slick goo. I swear to God, my fingerprints are now embedded all over this camera because the, the, the material holding it together has become this like semi like fluid material. You know what I mean? But the weirdest thing about messing around with this camera for so long and, and trying to understand it so intensely is I've realized this, that this is actually a realistic thing for a 13 year old to have in 2007. And it's not good, but I, I totally believe someone like Freddy would end up getting this for Christmas and would like use the hell out of it until it stopped working. And it's kind of weird that we never actually get to see that. We never actually get to see what iCarly would look like as a webcast if it was really filmed with the camera that we see on set every single episode. Are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Ah, uh, my hand is black. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the iCarly webcast. <laughs> This is it. This is, uh, this is the camera that Freddy uses in the show. Uh, this is what it looks like when he's really... When it's really filming something, you know? Yeah, but doesn't this feel kind of realistic for something you would see on YouTube in 2008? Like, this specific look. Like, not state-of-the-art, but someone trying their best, you know what I mean? And I have to ask, you know, once again, I mean, th you know, think about it, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, other people might do their iCarly content. Okay, but who else in the world would think to record their iCarly video with the actual camera from iCarly? The answer is this guy. He had the same idea. One thing you'll notice here is that uh, there's this little thing flashing in the middle of the screen, uh, and that says that there is no tape in the camera. There is a tape in the camera. Uh, every... This isn't a VHS camera, obviously. It's not a VHS camera, but... You know, when I was younger, I actually tried to collect VHS cameras because I very much like this aesthetic. I think this is a cool aesthetic. So I tried to collect these VHS... I tried to collect VHS cameras, you know what I mean? And what I found is VHS cameras were not designed to last into the 21st century for the most part. So every time I would buy a VHS camera, it would either be broken in some way that made it annoying to use, it would be entirely broken, or it would work for about three hours to a day. And the fault with this camera uh, is that it is now incapable of telling if there's a tape in the machine or not. And obviously, if it can't tell if there's a tape in the machine, then it can't record very well. This whole setup makes me really nostalgic, because like... Because I used to film with VHS cameras as a kid. And the, f the funny thing is, this apartment is nothing like my childhood home, but... Even just seeing the walls through a VHS-like format makes me really nostalgic for where I grew up because that's the way I remember it. I remember it through this kind of weird, grainy filter. And I like to think this is a very nice little quiet moment we've made for ourselves in the video. But I want to say that the reason I want to make this little moment in the video is that I remember iCarly Season 5 being the exact point in the series where I just didn't think it was fun to watch anymore. Um, and I have this gut feeling that I'm going to feel exactly the same way going into it this time. From what I remember, these next few episodes, they're really mean. And they're also the episodes that we've been waiting on. And so I don't think this is going to be a fun thing for me to go through. Um, but sadly, as we always have to say in segments like these, the only way to find out is to go ahead and get started. Now that we've kind of circled back around, can we stop for a moment and recognize exactly how big of a moment the Season 4 cliffhanger was? Constantly throughout the series, it has been teased as a possibility that Sam's cruelty directed towards Freddy is not indicative of a true hatred for him, but instead of an inability for her to find a way to show affection. 
The idea that Sam either hates Freddy and wants to see him suffer, or likes him and doesn't know how to say it, is something that is purposefully never made clear in the early seasons. The fact that she constantly tries to derail his romantic relationships and grows moody whenever she sees him with another girl is again something that could mean a variety of things, and is left as ambiguous to try and get the teenagers at home excited about the possibilities. And the revelation in season 4 that Sam indeed secretly loves Freddy and wishes she was in a relationship with him, well, it retroactively confirms the hidden subtext of her motivations in the entirety of the show so far. And it additionally sets up a storyline which will take up nearly half of the canon episodes of Season 5. Season 4 Episode 9 is easily one of the most cute and wholesome stories in the entire series. And if that's the case, well then Season 5 Episode 1 is the mean-spirited punchline to that setup. In the episode, we discover that after the two kiss, Sam immediately commits herself to a mental institution because she thinks admitting she's in love with Freddy means she's gone crazy. By the way, these kids have gotten a lot taller over the last few days. So Carly, Freddy, and Gibby go to this mental asylum and try to break Sam out, but are told off by the woman working at the front desk. Also, Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory is there for some reason. Kick my thighs. Kick them hard. <laughs> The gang get Gibby to distract the woman while they go and find Sam. Gibby's distraction involves violently assaulting her, thus keeping her eyes away from Freddy and Carly. After the cops presume that the woman is lying, Gibby befriends Sheldon, who tells him that he is from the future and needs to get back. Something Gibby believes because he is not smart. Carly eventually finds Sam and Freddy convinces her to come home. However, because Sam is under 18, she can't leave the asylum without being signed out by a guardian. Jane Lynch is too expensive to hire more than once, so they decide to have someone else impersonate Sam's mom. No, I am not dressing up like Sam's mom. We weren't gonna ask you to. I wanna do it! Sam goes in disguised as Miss Puckett, but is recognized by an old friend at the asylum, and they all get caught. The iCarly webcast is scheduled to start soon, and at the insistence of the inmates, they do the web show live from the Mental Institute, which is of course interrupted by the people inside. Warning, in the year 2029, aliens capture Ryan Seacrest. Bet you money that really happens. Live on the web show, Carly does something that makes everyone uncomfortable, announces to the audience that Sam likes Freddy, and that she wants to hear people's live reactions. Freddy's hot. Yeah, let's not get carried away. However, when Sam says that she doesn't care what the viewers of iCarly have to say, Freddy says that they have one last caller to hear from, at which point he pulls out a pair pad and calls into the show himself, declaring that no one has asked how he feels about this. Sam starts to yell at Freddy for wanting to humiliate her through rejection live on the internet, only for him to interrupt her with a kiss, reciprocating the cliffhanger and officially kickstarting their relationship. And now that we've reached this point, I think there's one thing that we all want to talk about. What's up with pair phones? You ever think about that? Like, this was a big thing in the early 2010s. Like, smartphones were a new thing, and every writer on TV was thinking, what's the next thing? They're gonna change the shape to a circle or a triangle. But have you ever thought about, like, the logistical nightmare that that would be? Like, think about video. When you watch Splash Face on your pair product, do you think that the video, like, just opens in the center with a bunch of black space around it? Or do you think it goes full screen and kind of cutting off the outer laying crust of the video. In the iCarly universe, there's probably debates about this. Like, are you a black border guy or a cut off the edge of the screen guy? Because both of those options sound fucking awful. Do you think there are video formats in the iCarly universe that are specifically designed to be pear-shaped just so you can watch them on pear-shaped devices? I mean, we can clearly see here that when Freddy uses a pear product to film something, it is not exported in a pear shape, it's exported in a regular 16 by 9 But like, wouldn't you not want that if you had a pear phone? Wouldn't you want to be able to open an image on your phone and be confident that you were being shown the full image that you took? How would you use a camera on a pear-shaped device? Once again, is the interface like shrunken down to be inside the pear? Or are you taking photos without even knowing what the sides of your images look like? And even if you design file formats which are explicitly pear-shaped, a pear is not a rotationally symmetric image. So if you turn your phone the other way, it's gonna look like this. 
I don't know, I guess I'm just trying to say, uh... It's hip to be square! So let's move on to Season 1, Episode 2, I Date Sam and Freddy. The episode begins with Sam and Freddy fighting, because of course it does. I remember this being a big problem I had with the story arc back in 2011. Like, I get that Sam and Freddy are going to be dysfunctional, but couldn't you have just made like two episodes where they're a cute couple, show them going on a ferris wheel or whatever sitcom cliches you want to pull from? But no, we go straight into the obvious issues at hand. As we find out, Freddy got a B on some paper, and in retaliation, Sam filled that teacher's car up with bees. Something Freddy dislikes because he doesn't want Sam fighting battles on his behalf. We quickly learn that a big issue at play is that Sam still doesn't respect his point of view, a stance she held when she hated him and still holds when it comes to their romance. However, Carly sets things straight, telling them how they're both a little right and a little wrong, and soon enough the fight is over. As it turns out, that Carly is a very good moderator in the couple's fights. Because of Sam and Freddy being so constantly absent and together, Carly and Gibby have been spending a lot more time together, despite having nothing in common. So Gibby adopts a dog that they can raise together so they'll have something to talk about. However, Carly doesn't want a dog, and has to constantly tell this to Gibby while he still believes that they're essentially raising a baby together. This storyline is what I like to call a joke ship. Like, the show sometimes does this, where it'll make a ship episode for a ship that no one asked for, like Spencer and Freddy's mom, for instance. But I have this weird gut feeling that the only reason Gibby is always paired with people as a joke is because he's a little chubby. Because I feel like if this actor lost 40 pounds, they'd give him actual romance story arcs. Meanwhile, in the C-plot, Spencer makes a lawn in the living room, and he mows the lawn, and he shucks corn, and he makes corn juice. This show is out of ideas. Every time Gibby comes on screen, he says his name now, which is like the writers trying to Pavlog dog us into thinking any situation that the character arrives to is funny by default. I think the issue at hand is that Noah looks like an adult now, so the writers no longer find his nudity entertaining. So they just want us to believe by default that Gibby himself just invites a funny aura when that really isn't true. Because Carly is so good at mitigating their arguments, Freddy and Sam begin constantly returning to her to try and get satisfying consultation. At one point, they wake her up at 3 a.m. because they've gotten in a fight about which of them have worse moms before she goes back to bed. Eventually, they start bringing her with them on dates, asking her to sit in an island to the side and put aside any disagreements that they end up having. Carly becomes increasingly stressed out until she eventually has a meltdown in the middle of a crowded restaurant. Afterwards, she delivers her final judgment. If they can't work these things out on their own, then they shouldn't be dating at all. And that is how we end episode two. In episode three, the pair have mainly worked things out, keeping their fights to a minimum, and generally being very happy with each other. However, two main issues arise from both parties. Firstly, Freddy is so obsessed with Sam that he's begun subconsciously cutting Carly out of frame when filming skits. And second, Sam has begun acting physically abusive towards Gibby, with the accepted explanation being that she still wants to get her pent-up rage out even if she can't direct it at Freddy. Around this time, Freddy is saddened to discover that he hasn't gotten into a summer camp that he applied to, despite being the perfect applicant in every single way. The main conflict of this episode is that Freddy still has yet to tell his mother about Sam, fearing that her being ultra-controlling and ultra-protective would cause her to go crazy at the idea of the two being together. At one point, when Freddy's mother tries to stop by, Freddy asks Spencer to lie and say that he's somewhere else. However, Spencer is struck by a dilemma, because he doesn't like telling lies, and they've done this one before. There was a season one one episode explicitly about how Spencer doesn't like lying. They are reusing B-plots now. Quick side thought, the biggest downside to Sam's mother being played by a celebrity guest cameo is that there are a ton of episodes this season where it feels like her showing up would add a lot to the story. Like, the idea of having an episode where both of their moms are teaming up to try and stop them from dating, I don't know, that just seems like the kind of entertaining thing they would have come up with back in season one. Gibby decides that he's had enough of the pair, and ends up telling Freddy's mother about the relationship, causing her to scheme to break them up. At one point, at the suggestion of Gibby, Freddy's mother tries to bribe him with a piece of metal worth almost a hundred thousand dollars, saying that he can keep it if he breaks up with Sam. So to repeat that, Freddy's mother tried to bribe him 
with $100,000 to break up with Sam. A third time, Freddy's mother bought something worth $100,000! Sam and Freddy end up not showing up the night of iCarly's broadcast, and so Carly and Gibby have to do it on their own. I'm Carly! <laughs> the couple finally show up hours later and say that Freddy's mom stalked them to their date. And long story short, they lost their phones and ended up on some random boat all night. Carly is furious that the two have once again ruined another episode of their web show, as Sam and Freddy note that Carly might just be jealous. Indeed, they argue, she could have been the one to tell Freddy's mom that they were dating, at which point Carly lets it slip that it was Gibby who leaked out the info, causing Sam to physically assault him, causing serious injury and hitting Spencer in the balls. While Gibby comes back from the hospital and Spencer recovers with a bag of ice, Freddy's mother convinces Carly that Freddy and Sam being together has made everyone's lives worse, and thus the only moral thing to do is for all four of them to scheme behind their backs to break the pair up. And so Carly shares the information that will do just that. Freddy didn't get into the summer camp he applied to because Sam sabotaged his application, changing all of the answers. She did this months before they started dating, meaning that it's something that she wants to keep away from him now that they're an item. Meanwhile, Gibby tries to eat his own hair. I don't like this character anymore. Freddy's mother shares the horrible information with him, and it goes over just as chaotically as you would expect. Why'd you do this to me? I was mad at you. For what? Remember? I asked you what time it was, and you said, I don't know. <laughs> Freddy is extremely mad, and it really seems like the two are going to break up before Carly runs upstairs and decides to intervene, telling Freddy that he can't break up with Sam over this. Gibby decides he's changed sides and drags Mrs. Benson out of the room, as Carly forces the two to stay together, saying that Sam is like a wild pet. There's chaos that comes with her, but that doesn't mean she doesn't love you. As the two embrace, Gibby begins singing an original love song, implying that somehow this was his plan all along. And there we go, love is blossoming and in the air until the next episode. Season 5, episode 4 starts with the most bombastic retcon in the show's history. Freddy is really, really into trains and is in fact in a model train club. I know, I know, I didn't believe it either. This doesn't surprise Carly, but what does is the revelation that Sam and Freddy haven't done anything together in several days. They have different interests, different friend groups, and different hobbies, and so while they go on dates, they aren't totally dependent on each other. Carly insists that this simply won't do, and that they must try and join in on each other's interests. Agreeing to try it out, Freddy invites Sam to his model train club, and Sam pretends to be interested and says yes. Moments later, Spencer enters and suddenly recognizes a girl in the hall. It turns out that this woman, who now works for the principal, was once his childhood babysitter, and the two eventually decide to stay in contact. This single instant unleashes a domino effect, that will ultimately ruin the show. Spencer and the woman end up going on several dates, and it ends up going extremely well. However, it is an extremely dysfunctional relationship, as the two basically copy and paste the same rules that they had when they were younger, but redistribute it all to be romantic in nature, making the whole thing feel like a role play being put on by a middle-aged couple at a bar. Oh, Jenna wouldn't let me have dessert. Has someone refused to eat his vegetables? I didn't wanna! The two have a date while Gibby and Spencer are over, but she ends up saying the movie is too scary and sends Spencer and Carly to their rooms. At which point, Gibby invites her to dim the lights, sit down, and continue the film. And when she does, Gibby says his name out loud very flirtatiously. I'll remind you that this woman works at Gibby's school, and she's five years older than Spencer, and Gibby is underage, so this is a Gibby gets molested moment. 
Meanwhile, Freddy takes Sam to his train club meeting, and holy hell, this is cool. I'm sorry, I'm not really into trains, but this is an objectively cool space. Which of these kids has the coolest mom in the world? This is awesome. The boys take joy in seeing these small moments of happiness as each train goes off one at a time. But while they're out of the room, Sam sets both of the trains to go off at once, causing them to collide mid-track, destroying hundreds of dollars in train collectibles. N not that I would know. It's not like I've, you know, bought trains or anything. There's train in my milk. Drink it! <laughs> so they found out that Sam isn't compatible with Freddy's hobbies, but they're still not sure about the other way around. So Sam invites Freddy to take part in her weekend interests, going to visit her uncle and cousin in prison and trying to sneak contraband in to give to them. I brought you the stuff. Where? Whoa, whoa, okay. Oh, prisoners in my pants. They get caught and Sam's family are thrown in the hole. And Sam then spends copious time yelling at Freddy for not being good enough at getting honey glazed hams out of his pants. They confide in Carly, who says that maybe they shouldn't get involved in each other's hobbies, but that it doesn't mean their relationship is over. She notes that her relationship advice isn't always rock solid because she doesn't have a boyfriend. She then goes downstairs and sees Spencer being read a bedtime book by his girlfriend while he rests in his pajamas. Carly has finally had enough and snaps at the two, telling them that their relationship isn't healthy or destined to last. They're not having a normal relationship, they're awkwardly inserting romance into a pre-existing dynamic that had nothing to do with romance at all. And they need to stop pretending they can be a couple when they both know that it's weird and wrong. And while Carly gives a speech that breaks up Spencer and his babysitter, Freddy and Sam loom at the staircase and come under the impression that Carly's outburst might also apply to them. And as they head down in the elevator for the night, Sam stops at mid-voyage, something Freddy seems to have wholly anticipated. They have a long, serious conversation where they admit that they're not truly compatible like they would have wanted to be. At least, not yet. And as they amicably break things off, Freddy tells Sam that he loves her, and Sam replies with much of the same. And you just know that when they finally get off that elevator for the night, and Freddy watches that girl walk away. He's thinking to himself, WHY DIDN'T I TAKE THE HUNDRED THOUSAND DOLLARS?! As a kid, I remember this story arc being the last time that I went out of my way to consistently watch iCarly. And perhaps contradictorily, it's the story arc that ruined the show. Because the biggest problem with this story is that it's pretty much identical to I Saved Your Life, the Creddy event story. The characters start dating, it's far from immediately perfect, and they decide they need to take a break to see if they're a better fit for each other a little bit down the line. And then it's almost never spoken of again. Do you see how something like that could potentially ruin the reasons that people liked the show? Because iCarly was at least partially about the will-they-won't-they they appeal that was generated from these character dynamics, and these two story arcs turned that into they did, they could again, and they might, but they don't feel like it this week. And it's like, personally sitting here, you know, talking about this at this point in the saga, I'm feeling kind of depressed, and I'm sure you guys are feeling that at home secondhand, because the SETI story arc was a lot of build-up and then a really disappointing payoff in some of the weakest episodes in the show's history. And here's what this has always been about. iCarly doesn't do storylines about the web show anymore, they don't do storylines about romance anymore, and Spencer doesn't even really build sculptures anymore. So why are we still here? What is all this about? How is this even still iCarly? Because this might as well be good luck Charlie for all I care. We have 19 episodes left. What could those 19 episodes possibly be about? What, are they gonna go work at the Apple store? Are they gonna open a restaurant? Are they gonna go on Jimmy fucking Fallon? I think the people working on this show didn't understand the appeal of the program, and they really didn't understand why people liked the SETI ship. I know, I know, it's become pretty obvious at this point that I was a SETI shipper, I was from the very beginning. 
And to be honest with you, I've never even met a Credit Shipper. I don't think it was that popular. And if you were a Credit Shipper, I'm just going to kind of presume that you were so used to the male lead and the female lead always ending up together that it was just outside of your comfort zone for that not to happen. Uh, let me guess. When you read Harry Potter, you were upset that Harry and Hermione didn't get together. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's pretty clear what was going on there. But as a SETI shipper, I think the ultimate appeal of the pairing to most of the kids at home is that we really liked Freddy and we really liked Sam, but they weren't good people, you know, especially Sam, but still Freddy to some extent. And I think the reason that kids at home wanted Sam and Freddy to ultimately end up together is the only way that could happen is if they both realistically grew a lot as people. We wanted Sam to get over her deeply rooted issues and her violent complexes. And we wanted Freddy to develop a damn backbone and learn some street smarts. But I think that's not what the showrunners wanted. They just wanted a new couch gag every week. I think they wanted Sam specifically to never evolve. Her being a fundamentally broken person was funny to them, and thus they wanted her to stay that way forever. I have this thing I say a lot, that sitcom characters are not allowed to be happy because most sitcoms are about dysfunction. And that's why people say that sitcoms get ruined when there's a wedding or a baby. Because happiness itself isn't very funny to a lot of comedy writers. And that's why you always hear these creators say, Oh, we can't bring back The Office. Oh, we can't bring back Friends. Because the only way to make these shows work is for everyone to be miserable. And these characters, they deserve to be happy. And after this storyline, I think a lot of people just clocked out on iCarly because we all realized that the only way that these characters were ever going to be allowed to be happy is if the sitcom ended. And they were allowed to stop existing with a smile on their faces. Season 5, Episode 5 is a Tebow-centric episode. So in the story, we learn that Tebow has been living in the second floor of the Groovy Smoothie basically since it opened. And when a health inspector sees this, he says that it's against city ordinances. So Tebow essentially becomes homeless overnight, much to the dismay of Carly, who insists that they try and find a way to fix this. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, Freddy's mother loses $20,000 buying two rare chickens hoping to sell their eggs for $1,000 each. However, the birds won't lie with each other and thus won't lay eggs, meaning that she's out of her investment. Well, you know, if she sells that solid hunk of metal from a few episodes back, she'll have a solid 80 grand left over. Meanwhile, in the C-plot, Spencer buys a safe at the local junkyard and is trying to find numerous ways to get it open. Tired of being distracted by the main three, he suggests that Freddy have his mom rent out their spare bedroom to Tebow, meaning that she can make back the money and Tebow has somewhere to live. However, Freddy and Sam think that his mom won't like Tebow for, uh, uh, reasons. And they decide that they need to change him. They need to clean him up. Freddy's mom doesn't like black people. Meanwhile, in the D-plot, Sam finds a really big fork and decides she needs to use it as much as possible, obsessively eating with it as often as she can just to indulge the art of oversized cutlery. Meanwhile, in the F-plot, Carly meets a cute boy at the Groovy Smoothie, but is horrified to discover that he's snobbishly intelligent enjoying foreign films and being well-versed in the modern world. She begins studying for dates with him and even asks Spencer to break his nose as a distraction when the date turns sour. So, on the night of Carly's most important date, Freddy, Sam, and Gibby dress Tebow up in a fancy suit and ask him to talk smooth and suave to win Freddy's mother over. Also, Gibby made the suit himself because apparently he's a tailor now. Carly hides electronics all over the room so she can use them to look up whatever her boyfriend talks about, distracting from their evening as she rarely has any idea what's going on. He catches her in the act, looking at her cheat notes, and declares that she has been dishonest, something much worse than being stupid. Sam is so intent on making Carly feel better that she gifts her giant fork to her, 
before revealing that she's found an even bigger fork. Tebow's meeting with Mrs. Benson goes over very well, as he's able to compulsively lie his way into a place in the apartment, signing a lease for a whole year, although he still is going to have to keep up his ruse. Spencer opens the safe, and inside is another safe! Ha! <laughs> Season 5, Episode 6 is the second blooper episode. They are nine words, are you happy? Season 5, Episode 7 is perhaps one of the most anticipated episodes we've had coming since Season 3, being a finale to the very episode where I ended my last video. I'm talking about I Still Psycho, the second part of the Psycho Trilogy. At the beginning of this story, the cast learn that Nora Derslitz, the villain of the original story, is being considered for parole, and that as victims of her crime, they are invited to come and give testimony on if they think she should be kept in prison or released. Sam hits Freddy in the balls and goes to steal his pudding. Meanwhile, Spencer is soaking his feet in milk. I have the weirdest instinct to skip this one. Sam has a resistance to go and testify at Nora's hearing, saying as someone who's been to jail, she hesitates to force someone else to stay there. At this exact moment, Tebow burges into the room, half-dressed, exclaiming that he's grown tired of the ruse he's had to keep up to continue living with Freddy's mom. Although Freddy insists that lying is a necessity for him to continue living there. Oh, I'm not offended. I feel all warm inside knowing your mom would be disgusted if she knew the real me. That's nice. Let's all just pretend that Tebow doesn't have feelings. <laughs> Gibby then enters with the episode's official D-plot. He has just gone to the mall and has had his head scanned for over two hours in order to create a complete composite copy of his own head. And boy, have I never seen a joke flop this hard. I think this is perhaps the most infamous Gibby joke, as they run with this for the rest of the series and maintain it as his new flanderization quirk. And I have never met someone who enjoys this bit. You, you know, who's like, when I think of Gibby, I think of the decapitated head. Funniest shit I've ever seen. Carly insists that they all go to the hearing, and once there, Nor gives a depressing speech about how she deserves to rot in jail, and that at least there, she has more friends than her life before. Carly tries to give testimony about how Nora shouldn't be let go, but ends up feeling so bad that she pivots, saying that it's been enough time for her to be released. Gibby tries to make a bunch of jokes about his head, but no one laughs. While they're away, Spencer begins going on a long series of dates with a beautiful woman, who is into nerdy topics and making out. However, their dates are constantly derailed by Tebow bursting into the room and complaining about Mrs. Benson. Tebow even begins flirting with Spencer's date in front of him, and Spencer just locks your door. What kind of apartment in a massive skyscraper only has a chain lock? Spencer ends up buying a zombie video game, but his TV is broken, so when Freddy's mom heads out on a trip, they end up playing it at her house with Tebow. However, she comes home early, and Tebow's cover is blown, as he gives a triumphant speech about how he's Tebow, and no one can stop him from being that way. Mrs. Benson kicks him out, he is once again homeless. Quick note, if this ever happens to you, stand your ground. Tebow in this case has a pre-signed lease with Mrs. Benson, meaning that she can only evict him with a 30-day written notice. She isn't allowed to just throw him out onto the street because they had a minor disagreement one day. Nora is released from prison and almost entirely because of the testimony of Carly, and she's placed into the custody of her parents, who holy shit that guy's got tiny hands. It turns out Nora's parents are throwing her a coming home party. They've invited all of her classmates from school, none of which are planning to come, and instead, she ends up inviting the other I Carly gang, and no fucking way they fall for this twice. They do, and when Spencer comes to pick them up from the house, he too is entangled, and the plan is kicked off as they're all locked indoors. As we find out, the Nor's mother is in on the plan to get revenge. Nor's mother has attached Spencer to a gigantic wheel. And if the gang try to escape or retaliate, Spencer will be left spinning in place, surely killing him or something. Nora says that the gang might have gotten her out of prison, but that they also tainted the memory of her 16th birthday party. We're going to undo the taint. <laughs> and so they plan to recreate said party, but this time, it will truly go on forever. They dance to the music and Freddy is sexually assaulted, which is funny because he's a guy. <laughs> <laughs> They're all eventually left alone in the room, and thinking fast, they disguise Gibby's head as him being asleep, and he escapes through the only way he can think of, 
through the chimney. However, he gets stuck at the top and can't get out, and he's left there overnight. Nora and her mother quickly catch on to the deceit and begin searching for Gibby while Spencer spends for eternity. Nora's dad gets home and we learn that he's in on the plan as well. Ultimately, the gang are saved not by Gibby, but by an obsessive string of continuity deep cuts. In season two, we learn that Freddy's mother has had a chip implanted into his head, which allows her to track where he is at all times. In season five, we learn that Freddy has since learned about this as he complains about it to Sam and Carly. In season four, Spencer becomes addicted to pranking people, and one of the ways he pranks Carly is with a pen that electrocutes her when pressed. Freddy theorizes that disabling the tracking chip in his head will immediately tell his mother his location, and Sam has previously stolen Spencer's shocking pen because she thinks it's cool. And so, they press it up to Freddy's head, shorting out the chip, knocking him out, and alerting his mother to their true location. Tebow volunteers to take Mrs. Benson on his motorcycle, and they drive through Nora's front door. Sam flips Nora over the table, Tebow breaks down the basement door, and Carly unplugs the wheel, releasing Spencer. Tebow takes out the dad, and when the girls take out poking irons, Mrs. Benson pulls down swords from the wall. And of course, because she was a fencing champion as a child, Mrs. Benson easily kicks the asses of both girls, even when taken at once. Sam begins knocking the door slits out with the pen, and Nora warns that if she tries, she will have revenge, but Sam goes ahead and does it anyways. Mrs. Benson is ecstatic to have saved her son, and she allows Tebow to move into her apartment once again. All is well, the characters are safe, except they forgot Gibby. I'm still here! I Still Psycho is a great example of that thing I was talking about before, where the show has very slowly pivoted away from being a program about internet culture, and is now primarily focused on being about iCarly's own self-worth. The show's value is now staked in the fact that the show has value. And it's worth pointing out that there's probably a very good reason that this has ultimately happened, because this episode aired on December the 31st, 2011, the day before 2012. 2012 is famous for being a very, very exciting time for internet content, mostly because a lot of people were 14 that year. But it's also an age of the internet that is very, very different from the internet in 2007, and iCarly, for better or for worse, is a commentary on the internet as it existed in that year. So I really feel like the writers were incapable of even trying to adjust to the internet's change in tone. So it made a lot more sense to just pivot away from the topic. Moving on now, let's talk about episode eight, the last story in season five that I wouldn't call an event episode. In fact, I would call it filler. Eyeballs is the first of two episodes this season, which are Carly Light. Basically during the time Miranda Cosgrove was pushing a music career on the side, and because she was busy touring, the show needed an excuse to barely have her appear in certain select episodes. In the episode, Carly suddenly has to go to Yakima to take care of her grandfather, leaving the iCarly webcast to be done without her. Freddy, feeling like he has yet to prove himself as a creative member of the team, insists that he be allowed to co-host, with Sam remarking that a trash bag filled with yogurt could be a better comedy partner than him. Freddy does a skit which is considered extremely unfunny and cringe, and storms off, causing Sam to indeed introduce the bag of yogurt as a side character. As a side note, two of the people who have come to see his performance live are Mrs. Benson's therapist and his daughter, who has a very rare and severe vision problem which forces her to wear daunting glasses all of the time. Trying to help him through his blues, Sam says that being the technical side of the webcast still invites creativity, leading him to remark that he's been trying to figure out how to make iCarly 3D without 3D glasses. He somehow does this, making a special iCarly stream, which is somehow... 3D, despite being a single image. Meanwhile, Spencer wants to hire a lackey to do all of his work, despite the fact that he doesn't even have a job. He finds that partner in a man he meets in a men's room, and the two have wacky adventures. Freddy discovers that his 3D effect seriously damages the depth perception of anyone who watches the web show, 
causing the iCarly cast to flee from their problems, because that's basically the show's thesis statement. The effects are merely temporary, but Freddy still mopes that his experiment has only brought pain into the world. This is until the therapist and his daughter return, with her announcing that the iCarly 3D webcast cured her severe eye condition. Spencer discovers that he has negative $11 in his bank account, and that he's causing himself to go broke entirely to keep this newly found friend employed. However, the assistant says that he can't keep ruining Spencer's financial life, and he respectfully quits, noting that Spencer has been the best boss he's ever had. There's an extremely homoerotic montage of them doing stuff together, and that's where the story ends. If this episode had been in season one, I wouldn't have mentioned it. But we're so starved for content at this point that I'm describing every single thing that happens in this show out of desperation. And with that, we transition forwards to perhaps one of the most strange and infamous episodes in the history of iCarly. Season 5, Episode 9, I Meet the First Lady. At the start of the story, Carly and the gang are planning a massive birthday party for her unseen father, who is supposed to be visiting Seattle for his birthday, being the first time she's seen him in a very long while. Spencer accidentally blows up the cake, forcing Carly to go out and get a second one. However, by the time she gets home, Spencer has learned some bad news. Something has happened in another country, and her father won't be coming home from the Air Force after all. He was in the Navy before, why did they make it the Air Force now? What's going on? Anyways, Carly goes and cries in her room, barely being able to muster the energy to come up and do the iCarly webcast. However, there, she is given shockingly great news. They're going to Skype call Carly's father live on iCarly. However, the signal is weak, and while her father can see their side, they can't see him through the static, because the internet is analog in this universe. He types out responses to everything in the video chat, and thus the gang are able to celebrate his birth without actually casting him. Carly is ecstatic and unable to have her mood ruined, until things come to a halting stop. The gang are all visited by members of the Secret Service, one of which is that dude from SNL before he was famous, who say that someone in the US government saw their transmission to a secure military base and has an interest in meeting them. Sam tries to buy them all disguises so they can sneak out of the country before they're caught in the act, and are returned to the Shea apartment to meet someone more important than the president himself, the president's wife, who now sits with Spencer eating spaghetti tacos while he recounts his many B-plots. Sam, Carly, and Freddy all react in shock to Michelle Obama being in their living room, and Tebow enters shortly after. Having no idea who she is, he immediately tries to hit on her. Stop. Isn't it Tebow? Oh, she married? A couple things I found out while researching this is that first of all, some of these people are actually really secret service, like actually. Second, Tebow was not originally scripted to appear in this episode. In a live stream with Salty DK Dan last year, Boogie talked about how he actually confronted the show's creator about being left out of the story. Yeah, uh, Michelle Obama was on the show. That's right. Before anything, you know, I'm black. Right? So to see first black guy, the president, it's incredible. Not just for me, but for my mom, my grandma. So to be in Hollywood, have an opportunity to act alongside the first black first lady oh my god that's 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 never gonna happen again yeah that that was probably crazy cool and i actually in that episode i wasn't in that episode salty mm -hmm. I wasn't supposed to be, i wasn't work i wasn't booked to work that next week and i remember i came up to the, and i was like bro first black president ever his wife is gonna be here and you don't have the only black guy on the show on, <laughs> on that episode and he's it's just true laughing. He goes, oh shit huh i go man he goes you want to be on it i go man do you think i should be on it he's like yeah, yeah, yeah you're right you're right you're right so we kind of <laughs> laugh about it you know <laughs> Tebow leaves, but returns minutes later upon realizing what he's just done, and tries to apologize. Mrs. Obama gives an impassioned speech about how inspiring it is that Carly loves her father, and keeps moving despite him being away. Sam interrupts her to ask if she can have a sandwich, because that sure sounds like something she would say. Obama also praises her friends for supporting her, and says that being part of a military family can be very difficult. So you see, the kids didn't do anything wrong. Michelle Obama just wants to congratulate them for actively pushing propaganda for the US government. 
Her kids are also big fans of iCarly, and when she learns that they're about to livestream an episode, she insists on being involved. This is apparently kind of a true story. Michelle Obama was only written into one scene, but specifically requested being able to do the random dancing sequence because she often watched iCarly with her daughters and knew that it was their favorite part. And that's where we end the episode, with the gang rocking out with the first lady. Episode 10 is mostly about the gang committing a crime, so we're going to go ahead and save it for the end. Which means it's time for everyone's favorite segment, the I Crimes Analysis. Okay, let's go ahead and just hop back to the beginning. In Season 5, Episode 1, Sam has been admitted to a mental asylum, and the gang need to distract the woman at the front desk to find her. Thinking fast, Gibby jumps behind the counter and apparently wrestles the woman to the ground. The police are called, but Gibby claims that he only fell behind the desk, and the police immediately dismiss the woman's claims because all pigs are racist. So I'm calling Gibby attacking this woman I Crime number 44, and Carly and Freddy trespassing I Crime number 45. I Crime number 46 is Sam filling a teacher's car up with bees. I Crime number 47 is Sam physically assaulting Gibby numerous times because she can't do it to Freddy anymore. I Crime number 48 is Sam injuring Gibby so badly that she dislocates his breastbone and rips a clump of his hair out. I crime number 49 is Sam hitting golf balls at the girls' soccer team and hitting one of them in the head. I crime number 50 is Sam trying to sneak honey glazed hams into prison through Freddy's pants. I crime number 51 is Sam stealing the taser of a prison guard when she's attending Nora Dershlet's hearing. A lot of these crimes revolve around Sam. That's an interesting coincidence. And with that, we now move on to the Season 5 finale, and yet another episode which was mostly written to be a Carly Light story. At the beginning of the episode, we learn that Sam has made a massive stride as a person. She hasn't gotten into any kind of trouble in over 10 days, something that she hasn't been able to do since she was 4 years old. And as a reward, she is given tickets to an exclusive tour of her favorite place in the world, the Canadian Fat Cakes Factory, which produces fat cakes so good that they're banned in America. And so the gang cross the border for the day, but Carly stays behind because she has a date with a cute boy and wants to get ready. In her half of the story, Carly takes a long hot bath, and after watching old TV, wonders if she can get her toe stuck in the faucet. Indeed she can, and she cries for help until Mrs. Benson finds her. Her date eventually finds her as well, and they have their date while she's still in bath, wearing nothing but a t-shirt. This section contains no crimes, but it makes my brain bleed. Back in the A-plot, the rest of the gang take the tour of the Foreign Sweets Factory. When given the chance to try the coconut-coated perfection, Gibby offers to be the first in line, and is assaulted and knocked out by Sam, I crime number 52. Sam really likes fat cakes and begins crying. They try and get across the border, but Spencer insists that they first have their bags checked by the Border Patrol. And while they're here, Spencer continues one of the worst running jokes in the show at this point. I know you have a crush on me. What? Nothing. <laughs> And that statutory rape joke number- wait, wrong video. However, while they're trying to cross the border, a dog sniffs something on Sam, and the truth is revealed. She has laced her body with hundreds of illegal Canadian fat cakes, and is thus trying to smuggle contraband across the United States border. This is eye crime number 53. However, it's such a small thing that she's immediately released, but can only cross the border if she proves she's an American citizen. She has no passport or ID, meaning that she's incapable of doing this. And so, Gibby thinks of a brilliant plan. Smuggling Sam across the border in a suitcase, I crime number 54. However, Sam gets mixed up with another bag and she ends up in Malaysia. What a funny way to end the season. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final intermission of the iCarly binge through. We have just finished season 5, which means that directly after this is season derf, I, I mean 6, season 6, sorry. But, but the point is that after this we have one more season and then we are completely finished with the original run of iCarly. And so I want to use this final intermission to do something that I've been itching to do for a while, and that's discussing what I call the Nickelodeon sitcom universe. Now, the NSU is exactly what you would presume it to be. It is a theory that based on numerous crossovers and cameos, several Nickelodeon sitcoms from 2004 to today are set in one shared continuity. 
Now keep in mind that there are numerous Nickelodeon shared universes, so just know that when I use the term NSU, I'm specifically referring to the one connected to iCarly. So let's talk about a few iCarly fan theories specifically connected to the NSU. Continuing on from our last video, let's talk about iCarly fan theory number four. Drake and Josh, Zoe 101, and iCarly all take place in one shared universe. As I say this, many of you at home are probably smiling and nodding because this was intended to be something so obvious that even kids at home could figure this out. iCarly was created from the ground up to feature a lot of basic building blocks introduced in other Nickelodeon shows. So many of the brands, companies, and films that the characters will name drop tend to originate from Zoe 101 or Drake and Josh. For instance, Daka Shoes, the shoe company who gives the group a sponsor deal in Season 1, that company originates from a storyline in Drake and Josh. Galaxy Wars, a concept mentioned often throughout the franchise, also originated on Drake and Josh and was mentioned on Zoe 101. The Peruvian Puff Peppers make a cameo in one story, as we discussed, and in the same episode, Sam can be seen cooking with a Gary Coleman grill. Again, a reference to a classic Drake and Josh storyline. These minor references happen almost too often to keep track of, and the thing is that after iCarly took off, this trend continued with many things introduced in iCarly then appearing in other Nickelodeon shows. For instance, the pear company technology seen in the show was later featured in Victorious and several other programs. Also, in Merry Christmas Drake and Josh, a TV movie which was filmed after iCarly had started airing, when Josh is flipping through TV channels, he briefly passes by the iWeb Awards, a concept key to the Japan event episode. Similar Easter eggs and references became common after iCarly ended, some obvious but others more subtle. For instance, Ginger Fox, who you'll remember as the show's mean-spirited Britney Spears parody, was later brought up in several shows, with her song from iCarly being sung by a karaoke team in Victorious, and a reference to her even making its way into Henry Danger years later. But I'm trying to download the new Ginger Fox music video and it's taking forever! And I was never exactly into any of those later shows, but I'm told that those sorts of cameos and references were far from uncommon and happened pretty often. However, if you're looking for something bigger than just easter eggs and mimicked brands, then there are a couple things worth talking about. Specifically, the four characters who originated on Drake and Josh and then appeared in iCarly. Firstly, there's Dr. Doty. Dr. Doty is a recurring character in the NSU, played by George Doty IV, a producer on most of these shows. In Drake and Josh, he's briefly seen looking over an injured football player, and in iCarly, he's seen being asked to reattach the ear of an MMA fighter. A paramedic, also played by Doty, is also seen in iPsycho, and it's unclear if that's the same character. However, to most people, the most clear and concrete evidence of iCarly being in the NSU can be found in Season 4, specifically in Episodes 6 and 7, where there is a running joke of different obscure characters from other NSU shows being fans of the iCarly webcast and coming to see them in person. This starts when the gang enters Webicon, with the Zoe 101 character Stacy Dilson briefly being seen in a crowd. This then continues with the slightly more memorable appearances of Craig and Eric, the lovable nerd duo from Drake and Josh. Eric, we learn, is a massive Creddy fan, although Craig is totally ambivalent to the in-universe iCarly craze. A few moments later, we also see another person at the convention, Gavin, a recurring employee from the movie theater where Josh works in the Drake and Josh sitcom. I'll remind you that this episode is also the one that Jack Black features in, and somehow that feels like the least spectacular cameo in the episode. Okay, so now that we've gone ahead and broken that down, I think we can all agree that this fan theory is 100% canon. Drake and Josh concepts appear in iCarly, iCarly concepts appear in Drake and Josh, and Drake and Josh characters cameo in iCarly, meaning that they are completely intended to be set in the same universe. So now that we've gone ahead and accepted that, let's move on to the next theory. iCarly fan theory number five. Drake and Josh is a TV show within the iCarly universe. What? Half of you right now are going like, huh? What? 
that doesn't make sense. And then the other half of you are like, oh yeah, I remember this too. This, this one's also real. Throughout the entire iCarly show, it is occasionally hinted and then directly stated that the main characters are fans of the Nickelodeon sitcom Drake and Josh. The biggest clue to this can be found in Sam's locker at school, where she has a cutout which is logically meant to be the real-world Drake Bell and distinctly not the in-universe Drake Parker. Other episodes follow this implication. In I Go Nuclear, the theme song to the show is heard playing on the radio. And in I Party with Victorious, Gibby is seen briefly wearing a baseball cap with the Drake and Josh logo on it, given to him by a makeup artist who works in Hollywood. And finally, in two episodes of the show, the characters are seen watching the Drake and Josh sitcom and making commentary on it. In I Get Pranky, Carly is seen sulking on the couch over her personal failure to pull off a prank, and she is pretty clearly watching an episode of Drake and Josh. You didn't kill her, Vey. The camera flash just stunned him. How come that little girl's so good at pranks? <laughs> Later in the episode, Spencer is seen briefly watching TV, and the clip we hear is very clearly Jerry Trainer playing Crazy Steve, also on Drake and Josh. But most importantly, in I Toe Fat Cakes, Carly is changing channels and briefly watches the Peruvian Puff Peppers episode, rolling her eyes and saying that she's seen it already. And our final clue lies in I Pear Shop, an episode that we've yet to talk about yet, where an Easter egg makes reference to both Drake and Josh and Zoe 101, cementing that both appear to be TV shows within this universe. Which is confusing, I know, but we basically have to take at face value that Drake and Josh is set in the same universe as iCarly, and that Drake and Josh is a TV show within the iCarly universe. These two facts are difficult to reconcile, but they are both very clearly intended to be canon aspects of this universe. And if that is too much for you, I don't think you're ready for this next one. iCarly Fan Theory number 6 iCarly is a TV show within the iCarly universe. Okay, so I'm about to say a sentence that has never been said before in the history of the human race. I want to talk about Game Shakers, because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in that show. Game Shakers was an attempt by the creators of iCarly to kind of recapture its energy years after it had ended. It was basically the same idea as iCarly, about a group of tween creators who suddenly become internet famous, except instead of creating web videos, they make video games. To me, this was basically their attempt to try and mimic 2015 YouTube culture in the same way that they had mimicked 2007 YouTube culture, but I don't think this attempt nearly went over as well as the previous one. And just like iCarly managed to have a Fred cameo to connect to said culture, Game Shakers also sought out having high-status gaming YouTubers appear on their show. Babe Carano and Kenzie Bell. Yup, these are the two seventh grade girls who are currently tearing it up with their hit game, Sky will. Now here's why Game Shakers is relevant to the discussion of the NSU. On Drake and Josh there was this character named Helen who essentially ran the movie theater where Josh worked. She was played by Community's Yvette Nicole Brown, except for that one episode where a completely different woman played her and we all pretended not to notice. The point is that Helen would later become a character who would cameo on numerous other shows to help sell the idea of the NSU, most notably Victorious. And Game Shakers was the final show where this ended up happening. So even pushing aside all the evidence we've talked about so far, on a basic level, Helen appearing in all of these different shows must mean that these shows take place in a shared continuity, meaning that at the very least, Drake and Josh, Victorious, and Game Shakers all take place in one shared universe. And because iCarly and Victorious cross over so constantly that it eventually became permanent, we have to accept that iCarly is a part of that specific shared continuity. Which logically means that based on all evidence, iCarly and Game Shakers are both set in the same universe. However, there's a big problem. Because in the same way that there was a Drake and Josh cameo on Game Shakers, there was also an extended iCarly cameo on Game Shakers, because Nathan Kress appeared in an episode. But he wasn't playing Freddy Benson, the iCarly character. He was playing Nathan Kress, 
the actor inside the Game Shakers universe who played the character Freddy on the sitcom iCarly. I might as well stop and break this episode down in some kind of detail because arguably this was the final piece of iCarly media before you know what happened this very year. So at the start of the story, the Shakers gang are testing out their latest video game, which is clearly something that runs on Flash but is being played with a bedazzled PS4 controller. Triple G finds a glitch in the game and Hudson tries to record a note about it on his juice box. Meanwhile, Babe and Kenzie are distracted because of an iCarly marathon currently airing on TV. Triple G tries to get them to focus but is himself mesmerized by the hilarity of the Nickelodeon classic. Just breathe me in, come on, breathe me in, come on, breathe me What is that, Knight Rider? I fixed her. They initially watch a season 4 episode, and then a season 6 episode, but they eventually make it around to the season 3 premiere, I Think They Kissed. They then watch the same season 4 episode as before, then a season 5 episode, and then they watch season 2's I Kiss, which is the prequel to the episode that they've already watched before, and also the episode ends distinctly not on the half hour mark, but 13 minutes early. Who is in charge of scheduling the iCarly marathons in this universe? You couldn't have done a worse job binging this show if you'd thrown a couple fucking bizarre varks into the middle. Oh, it's like Kid and the Kale, but not as funny. <laughs> After they get up and make some coffee, Triple G asks if they ever resolved which girl Freddy likes more, causing them to say that it's ambiguous but obvious. Freddy loves Sally. What? Anyways, they can't agree on who Freddy loves more, and Triple G suggests they ask the man himself, as Nathan Cress is doing a play in New York and is staying at a local hotel. The girls go to the hotel and witness a very attractive woman seduce her way into getting a celebrity's key. One of the girls tries to do this herself, but she is 12, so it's just really weird. What's the difference between her and us? Yeah, okay, okay, we get it. Jeez Louise, I guess this is how the world works. And then they get cilantro sprayed in their faces, which I guess is like PG-13 mace. However, Triple G thinks of a brilliant idea and dresses Hudson up like Freddie Benson, trying to convince the staff that he is Nathan Cress. This works out and they're able to sneak the two girls into the room, thus orchestrating breaking and entering. And that's game crime number one. They end up fingering Cress's pizza, which is an odd sentence to say. And they go through his wallet, geeking over the contents. He calls security, and they freak out and hide in the bathroom. Eventually, they come out, and as he sees that they're just anxious fans, he cancels the security call. They give him back his wallet and ask him which girl he thinks Freddy would end up with. Nathan almost gives his honest opinion before Double G bursts into the window, as he was also trying to break in by this point. Double G is connected to a helicopter and he orders it to fly off, crashing him through the hotel window. Security show up and quickly deduce that either these kids are doing something bad or Nathan Cress is really doing something bad. They all get sprayed with cilantro, the kids get taken away, that's it. There you go, that's the most recent iCarly themed episode set in the iCarly universe. So anyways, I'm gonna go ahead and pull back up that list of things that exist in the iCarly universe, and I'm gonna write down the iCarly sitcom, and also... Pro Jared. Now that your brains have turned to liquid and are probably prepared to accept almost anything, let's move on to iCarly fan theory number seven. iCarly is a part of the Disney Channel live action universe. Okay, so I don't actually personally believe in this one, but I found this fan theory while I was researching the show, and I thought it was so funny and so charming that I had to include it in this segment. I talked about this a lot in my video about fictional presidents, but at the exact same time that Nickelodeon was building up their own little sitcom universe, Disney Channel had become famous for doing the same thing, but a lot better and a lot more coherently. In the past, I've made fun of how ridiculously big this sitcom universe is because the recent inclusion of Girl Meets World accidentally connects the universe to the ABC sitcom universe, which is itself kind of massive. I've pointed this out before, but I want to say it again. My favorite detail about how easily you can link all these different shows together 
is that Sabrina the Teenage Witch and Wizards of Waverly Place are both concretely set in the same universe, which implies to me that these witch societies are so secretive that there's like five of them and they don't know about each other. However, to only complicate things further, one fan theory that I found online insisted that the Nickelodeon sitcom universe and the Disney Channel live-action universe are, in fact, the same shared universe. Evidence number one. Michelle Obama appears in both universes. Okay, that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. Okay, that's not actually the entire evidence for the theory, but everyone always points that out as if it means something. Like, Michelle Obama also exists in this universe, and we're not a part of the iCarly universe, as far as I know. However, the main key clue to this is the Sunshine Girls. The Sunshine Girls are a parody of the Girl Scouts, which by complete coincidence appear in both the Nickelodeon sitcom universe and the Disney Channel live-action universe. In the DCLAU, they first appear in That's So Raven, and then make appearances in the spin-off, Cory in the House. And then in the Nickelodeon sitcom universe, they first appear, I believe, in iCarly, and then make cameo appearances in such shows as Victorious. And finally, we have iCarly fan theory number eight. iCarly and Frasier are set in the same shared universe. MAKE IT HAPPEN, PEOPLE! And with that, we have now finished our final iCarly intermission, and we now move on to iCarly Season 6. Season 6 is going to be a weird experience for me, because at this point in the show's history, I had fully, completely, 100% stopped watching Nickelodeon. So ignoring the finale, which I went out of my way to see, I have no previous experience with any of the episodes that we're about to talk about. It seems to me, going into this, that iCarly Season 6 can be defined by two core things. Cameos by celebrities who probably had kids that told them that the show was cool, and the lowest ratings in the show's history. Now, I want to clarify something real quick. I often hear people say, well, iCarly started out big, but then it really fell on the ratings by the end. And while that's technically true, it's just a little bit dishonest to put it that way. Saying that iCarly fell in the ratings kind of implies that at this stage, there was another show that took its former place and was just as popular as it had once been. And that's simply not true. iCarly was a peak in viewership for the Nickelodeon channel that it would never truly replicate. There's this great page on Wikipedia that I've used constantly throughout this project that basically ranks Nickelodeon premieres by the highest viewing figures, and I think it goes down to like the top 35 or 45. But the thing about that page is the most recent thing on it is the iCarly finale. The big hot take here isn't that iCarly was failing, it's not even that Nickelodeon was failing, the true take is that Cable was failing. By 2012, Netflix and Hulu were both really starting to take off as, like, streaming service alternatives, and what people forget about that era is it did not take a lot of time for the middle class to basically turn on cable. Because cable sucks, okay? Nowadays, the viewing figures for cable television are all absurdly low when compared to stuff that was happening a decade or two before. A Cartoon Network show will run for like half a decade, and you go and check out who's been watching it live, and it's like half a million people an episode. Which is why so many of these former cable stations are now making their own streaming services, despite how hard it is to track how many of them there are now. But you know, this subtle nuance doesn't change the fact that the next 13 episodes of iCarly are statistically the ones which you are least likely to have seen before. So let's kick things off with perhaps one of the weirdest episodes in the show's entire run. You're about to watch a very special episode of iCarly. It's not for normal people. You might find it disturbing. <laughs> so April the 1st, 2012 was a big night for Nickelodeon as it hosted two very special premieres, the content of which was intended to be irregular, unrequested, surreal, in short, lol random. The first of these was iCarly Season 6, Episode 1, I, April Fools. And the second was Victorious Season 3, Episode 7, April Fools' Blank. 
The intention of these episodes, to put it rather simply, was to feel like their respective shows if watched under the influence. Both follow a fluid, nonsensical timeline, and both are not intended to be canon, yet are canon to each other. The iCarly episode is intended to be a trippy parody of clip show episodes, and indeed the suggestion of iCarly doing its own clip show. So let's go ahead and humor this one as we hop into the season six premiere. At the start of the story, Carly and Spencer are packing their things, as we learn that they're being forced out of their apartment and they can never return. As we learn, Spencer forgot to pay the apartment's rent, and Carly accidentally stabbed the owner of the building. The gang think back to all of their favorite memories, starting with the time they watched a clip show episode of a classic sitcom in their living room, which we flash back to before we then return to the present. However, they still have two more hours before they have to leave, and so they decide to hold a big party. They invite Tebow, who is a genie living in a lamp, and they ask him to teleport them to the next scene, where the party is rocking and rolling and everyone is having fun. However, they realize that they don't have a party bush, and Freddy begins to have an intense mental breakdown over this. Tebow materializes one with his genie magic, and all is well. They settle in, and it quickly becomes evident that they're going to do a clip show through flashbacks. But there's a catch. All of the clips are actually carefully recreated moments, with major twists on all of the events. Starting off, we cut all the way back to the pilot where Miss Briggs turns down Carly's list of kids to be in the talent show. However, at that moment, a temporal wormhole opens in the hallway, and from it emerges another Miss Briggs. I'm the real Miss Briggs from an alternate universe! <laughs> However, Miss Briggs reveals that if their energies collide, it will cause an explosion of galactic magnitude. The two begin a physical tussle and energy pulses through them, and they then both explode. Carly then thinks of the idea of starting a web show, and Freddy runs up and suggests the name I Carly. Sparky barks, and they laugh at his commentary. We flash back to the present, and we learn that Sparky is now dead, but that his head is mounted on the wall, where it still moves and barks. Also, Gibby occasionally comes in and hits Spencer with a stop sign, a scene which is much more famous for the web exclusive version for some reason. They then have a flashback to the Chick episode, where a new character who yells in Japanese is inserted into the dialogue. Gibby then enters the flashback and knocks the man out with the stop sign, and Sam says that she'll go get a shovel while Carly does a little dance. Back in the present, the gang reflect on a few more famous flashbacks that aren't real, before the Japanese man enters in the present and hits Gibby with the stop sign, finally getting revenge. Sam then electrocutes him with the wrong end of the shock pen. The party bush says that it needs water, and Tebow returns to bring it a small rainstorm, which no one seems to react strongly to. Even though Icarly is moving out, she's still in a good mood, causing the gang to wonder if she's ever in a bad mood. They then specifically recall one situation where she was. I made you some stuffed mushrooms. <laughs> Who cares? <laughs> When they escape from the flashback, they now have changed locations, being in Tori's house from Victorious, with Robbie and Rex sitting across from them. Robbie insists that he is Gibby, and as the gang stare at the audience, laughing hysterically, they suddenly flash back. The gang then remember back when Spencer had long hair, specifically when Freddy was hit by a taco truck and then he and Carly dated, which Carly refers to as 12 million viewers, despite the fact that it was only 11. Spencer insists that his hair wasn't that long, Long, and we see a flashback where it's about three times as long as it really was in the episode in question, and Spencer is wearing makeup to make him look even more like a girl. His hair gets even longer as the clip plays out. Carly is then visited by Mr. Bushwell and Lubert, haven't seen him in a while, and the gang trick the pair by having them join into a flashback where they agree to let Carly and Spencer stay. We never leave this flashback, and we just accept that the group's forced rewriting of history has gone unchallenged. After this, Spencer runs in, dressed as Doc from Back to the Future, and says that he's from a future episode of iCarly, where Freddy is raising kids with either Sam or Carly, although he says he can't remember which. They wonder how they can get to the future, at which point Tebow flies in with a Jetsons bubble and he shrinks them down for the voyage. 
Inside the ship, Carly asks if their show is still on in reruns in the future, to which Spencer responds, Reruns? Where we're going, we don't need reruns. <laughs> and yeah, that's a pretty accurate prediction, I guess. Now, wasn't that just a joyous waste of everyone's time? I love it when you get to the final season of a TV show, and they're so out of ideas that they make an episode that sucks on purpose and doesn't count. We'll be talking a little bit more about this April Fool's verse a little bit down the line, but for now, let's continue on to the actual, real, final 12 episodes of the show. And the only place that makes sense to start is Season 6, Episode 2. So as I told you guys, Season 6 is a weird beast for me, because it's a collection of episodes that I've never seen before. But what's weirder is exactly how many of these episodes could be called event stories, yet do not lead with the renounce of event stories. An event episode in Season 3 carried some weight. Even if you haven't seen it, you've maybe heard people talk about it somehow. But I'm not sure I could say the same thing about many of the episodes that we're about to get into. Case in point, Season 6, Episode 2, I Go One Direction. The episode where the cast meet the boy band, One Direction. Immediately, I imagine, some of you are presuming that this is editing trickery or a dedicated lie. But neither is true. This episode is 100% legitimate and is just not often talked about. So let's see what none of the hubbub is about. At the start of the episode, Spencer and Carly get back from a long trip, where Carly has caught some kind of virus. Spencer suggests he take her to a hospital, but she says that she just needs to get home and be alone. They open the door to find all of the other main characters inside. Sam, Freddy, Tebow, Gibby, Gibby's decapitated head. What is going on here? I'm cooking steaks. Playing video games. I'm in a kiddie pool. Gibby! Are we sure that we're not still inside the April Fool's episode? Carly keels over and Spencer says she's dying, and the laugh track gets really loud for some reason. We learn that Carly has jungle worms, and Gibby runs out of the room screaming. We're told that jungle worms are basically identical to tapeworms, they just don't want to use that terminology for some reason. I wonder why. After the opening sequence, Carly is visited by the show's recurring doctor character, who tells her that she's mostly move past the jungle worms, but that she still might be infectious, so she shouldn't kiss any boys. The good news is that she doesn't have a boyfriend and isn't planning on meeting any world-famous boy bands anytime soon. Freddy bursts into the room and announces that he just got an email from a world-famous British pop band called One Direction. Sam is excited, Carly is excited, and Gibby is really excited. The boys say they're going to be in the Seattle area and would love to be on iCarly to perform a song in their dingy, shitty attic. Later on, oh, they changed the transitions. I don't like this version as much. Sam runs in and says One Direction has just arrived and they're on their way up. And no need to introduce them, we just transition to them doing a song that I can't play clips from. They're told that while practice has gone well, the actual show starts around 7.30. Sam sexually harasses the band members which is funny because they're guys. And Gibby offers to rub their feet. This couldn't feel more like 1D fanfiction if someone started talking about Zane's cat. Carly, Sam, and Freddy go downstairs to get snacks for the band, and Harry suddenly gets really thirsty, causing him to take a drink from Carly's water bottle, which obviously is a problem because she's still contagious with jungle worms. Meanwhile, Spencer has repaired a piece of exercise equipment he found at a junkyard, and tricks an attractive woman into thinking that he's a personal trainer. Get it? Trainer? However, the woman actually sends her 12-year-old daughter, who smells his fudge. I've seen this storyline in 17 different sitcoms. Harry is really sick, and Zane and all the other members stand around and stare at him. Also, I swear to God, I don't think they had this many members in the last scene. Will somebody hold me? No, no, no. no, no. That... Harry tries to drink more from Carly's water bottle, and they all figure out what's happened. Harry stays in Carly's bed for a week, wow that sounds like fanfiction, but he doesn't get any better and the recurring doctor doesn't know why. Harry asks Carly to make him fruit cut up real special and to change his socks with warm ones. However, they eventually begin to piece things together. Harry Styles isn't sick anymore, he's just faking it so he can continue hanging out in Carly's bedroom, spending time with her and getting her to take care of him. 
Okay, serious question for anyone who was in this episode. When you got the script, did it look like this? Or did it look like this? Because no offense, but this reads like something you'd find in a middle school lost and found. Meanwhile, the little girl Spencer is training is really upset and mad that no one likes her. Spencer suggests she try being nicer, and she comes up with the idea of getting a makeover. I have a question. Has this little girl noticed that fucking One Direction keep hanging around this apartment where she's spending all this time? Because, like, I think that would be the main thing that most teenage girls would have noticed around that time period. If Harry Styles was sick and stuck in Carly's bed much longer, they'll have to cancel their tour so he can stay in Seattle. The good news is that while they wait, they can go out in public to a smoothie shop because Harry is the only band member anyone can recognize. Freddy thinks of a great way to try and encourage Harry to stop faking, making him think he's going to be replaced in the band. You don't know you're beautiful. No! Harry suddenly feels much better and insists that he can perform on iCarly that night. Spencer tries to give that girl a makeover, but she says he made her look worse, calls him an idiot, and storms off. Spencer yells back that they can't just end their story there and that they have to have some kind of resolution. Get it? They broke the fourth wall, they never do that. The gang performed the song, it goes over well, they break up three years later, I presume this episode is the reason why. I'm actually really impressed with how unique this episode feels. It's so creative in its blandness, it really takes this concept so much further than most episodes in the last few seasons. I love the fact that they had Harry Styles on the show and wrote him to be an awful person. Like, of course Harry Styles is a bastard in this universe. That just makes sense. For comparison, the plain white tees were on this show in season one, and I forgot to mention that, because it's just like they come on, sing a song, and walk off stage. But here, it's like a whole saga. They wrote it in an hour, but it's interesting to watch at least. Next, let's talk about season six, episode three, I Open a Restaurant. Perhaps the most anticipated filler episode of the entire series. For several classes in a row, Gibby goes mysteriously missing from school. Sam goes to investigate and figures out where he is, in the school's basement, which no one has known about for decades before Gibby discovered it. The Gibster plans to achieve his greatest dream in this new location, secretly opening a restaurant. Carly says this is ridiculous and that he'll surely get caught, but Freddy and Sam both think he has a shot at this. A running joke in this one is that Freddy is starting to have a crush on Carly again, and it's weird to everyone because it's like reverse character development. Is it too late for you to love me? What? Nothing. <laughs> Carly goes back to her apartment, but is hit with a massive flash and is temporarily blinded, as Spencer has built a giant combination of camera lights as a security feature. This is a bit that they stole from Frasier. And they thought we wouldn't notice. Back at the school, the restaurant is a total hit, and he's named it after his name set out loud for comedic effect. Gibby isn't worried about being ratted out because he's only invited cool people to attend. And Sam is his business partner, and secretly, his muscle. Gibby puts red pepper on Carly's pasta, but overdoes it, and she struggles to find any water until their lemonade is finally delivered. Interesting. That's red pepper lemonade. <laughs> That's the stupidest joke the show has ever made, and I absolutely love it. Carly runs out of the room screaming, then runs back into the room screaming, then runs out of the room screaming. Back at the apartment, Spencer has built a secondary security system, which is a robot that goes haywire and shoots popcorn pellets at everyone. Sam is able to hook Gibby up with better decor and seating, and he mounts his own decapitated head on the wall. A school bully with a fake New York accent shows up, having recently gotten out of juvie. The bully busts Gibby's chops, telling all his friends about how Gibby used to love taking his shirt off, to which Gibby says that he doesn't do that no more. The kid insists that Gibby get partially naked, and Gibby throws a fit, saying that it's his place and he deserves respect. Sam keeps him there until they close, and then fills the butter sock up with a pound of fresh butter, beating him repeatedly and splattering butter everywhere. The character doesn't get back up, there's just silence after this. And there's a few weird minutes where the B-plot plays out, and you're not sure if you just saw literal murder happen. 
But it turns out Sam just broke his arm, and he rats Gibby out to Mr. Howard. Mr. Howard discovers that the principal is attending the restaurant, and he orders that the location be shut down, as it is against school ordinances. Principal Franklin admits that this is his duty, and he tells Gibby to close the place down. However, when Howard and the bully are gone, he tells Gibby that he was just bluffing. Gibby's is the best food he's had in ages, and he insists that it stay open. I'm guessing that Gibby doesn't go to classes anymore. What a stupid episode. I'm actually going to go ahead and skip episode 4 and move on to episode 5, because it seems like a good idea to cover the two most infamous filler episodes together at once. This episode is one of the very, very rare cases with this show, where I can honestly say that the A plot here is one of the weakest in the show's history, but the B plot comes close to being one of the highlights. At the start of the story, Spencer has just built one of his first sculptures in ages, depicting a gigantic snow woman. And because it's Spencer, the statue catches on fire, a running gag which has only increased in volume since it was introduced. The firefighters who put this out are very annoyed, as he's easily become the most infamous man in Seattle to those in the department. The chief declares that it's been fun knowing them, but as this is the 18th fire Spencer has accidentally caused, they have decided to never answer Shea household calls ever again. If Spencer ever starts another fire in this building, the Seattle department will allow everyone in the apartment complex to die. A-F-A-B. Meanwhile, in the C-plot, Gibby is trying out deodorant for the first time, but can't decide which he likes more. So he begins shoving characters into both of his pits, and then asking them which he likes better. Gibby is so funny! All right, okay, Gibby! Good, alright. Just breathe me in, come on, breathe, Gibby! In the A-plot, Freddy gets a job working at the Pear Store, where he gets a discount and shares his love of technology with others. However, his overzealous, over tacky talk doesn't sell product. And when Sam bullies a customer into spending spending more money, she's hired and quickly promoted to a higher position. Meanwhile, Gibby begins talking to a different employee and causes him to have a mental breakdown. At the same time, Carly begins flirting with a cute tech boy who seems rather awkward. Spencer goes to the fire department and tries to apologize for the years of mistakes, bringing them all brownies. He says that he needs to have trust that the department will come and help if there's trouble. And so they come up with a solution. Spencer will join as a firefighter for a whole week, and then he will understand their pain. I wonder if he's going to burn down the fire department. Oh look, he's burning down the fire department. Oh look, he's back from burning down the fire department. Carly invites the cute boy over for a date and goes out of the room for a second. When she gets back, he is now a totally different person and chases her around until Spencer kicks him out. Freddy realizes that working at the pear store isn't fun while Sam is there and he quits. Sam also quits as that is apparently the only reason she was working there in the first place. Now, let's circle back around to the episode which we skipped before, Season 6, Episode 4. This episode is notable for two primary reasons. First of all, it is the show's second and final Halloween episode. And second off, it is the very last Neville Papperman story. Now, this episode originally aired in April 2012, so you might be wondering how this can be a Halloween episode. Well, it's simple. The plot of this one is about the characters realizing that Halloween is the best time of year, but it only happens once. And so, they decide to create a new holiday, celebrated every April, perfectly in between the previous Halloween and the next one. I don't think I'm gonna have time for a Halloween video this year, so, so appreciate this set for the five more seconds you get to look at it. Spooky, scary skeletons, this show ruined my schedule. The crew decide they want to hold a party that Saturday night and announce it on their webcast so strangers will come to Carly's house, which is obviously what you would want to happen. As this occurs, we see a shadowy figure open a notepad and begin jotting down plans for revenge. Freddy dresses up like Lubert, Sam dresses up like hand sanitizer, and Carly dresses up like sushi. I'm not gonna lie, that's adorable. 
They have the party in Spencer Makes a Game where you load into a basket of plushies by rope and have 8 seconds to grab as many as you want to keep. A robot comes in and gives the trio candy, but after they eat it their voices all become deep and distorted. Freddy finds the robot upstairs and learns that it's Neville. He calls Carly and tells her what he's found, but at this point two thugs pull him to the side. Neville plans on stripping Freddy down and putting him into the robot costume so he can be antagonized by Carly and Sam in his place. Carly and Sam find the robot and thinks it's Neville, and they strap him to Spencer's machine and repeatedly send him up and down into the plushies. The girls think that hurting Neville this much will mean that he'll never bother them again until Neville shows up with his posse. It turns out that Neville wants revenge because after he yelled at that guy in the wheelchair, they refused to help him repair his public image a second time. However, Carly says she's sorry that she didn't help, and she invites him to join the party. Neville is put in such a feeling of comfort that he shoes his muscle away, and then Carly orders Sam to take him. They then do to him what they did to Freddy, lowering him into the plushies over and over and over again. This episode is the lamest excuse for why Neville wants revenge, it's the lamest way he's ever found revenge, and it's the lamest comeuppance that he's ever gotten. Like, oh, he gave them candy that makes their voices deep. Oh, oh, but don't worry, because they're going to lower him into a pile of plushies over and over again. What a total waste of one of the show's most famous ongoing storylines. I mean, it truly feels like the show is sleepwalking through this final season of episodes. So we just talked about the final Neville episode, and it is thus fitting that our next story is the final Chuck episode. Chuck, as you'll recall, was the mean-spirited kid who bullied Spencer throughout seasons two and three, before vanishing from the extended cast. And sadly, this episode is not an exception to that. We learned at the beginning of the story that Chuck is now in the 8th grade, and is thus so physically large that he's able to prank Spencer in the ultimate way, by having his friends rip his clothes off and force him to run home naked. He gets home with tree branches, but accidentally brings a beehive with him, and the bees sting him in his penis. Spencer goes to the police and files a claim about the incident. The police take the crime very seriously, which means that Chuck ultimately either has to go to juvie or military school, and his father chooses military school. Spencer then runs into Chip, the little brother of Chuck, and he flees in fear that he might be seeking revenge. Later, he is assaulted by Chip, and fruit is duct taped all over him, even in sensitive places. Chip then decides that he wants to ruin Carly's life too playing loud music so she can't do her webcast without getting a copy strike. Meanwhile, in the Gibby plot, Gibby buys a working Galaxy Wars phaser, but Sam breaks it when she throws a bully over a table that it was sitting on. Freddy tries to fix it, but accidentally fixes it too well, as it now properly works as a real phaser. Eventually, it begins to overload, and Spencer has to throw it away from the apartment where it lands next to Chip, who is setting up a glue trap. The phaser explodes, and Chip is stuck to a wall. I commend them for finding an actor who really captured the energy of Chuck, but this episode just screams last-minute rewrite. I presume this is because the Chuck actor was still busy acting on the Disney Channel show that he was given after leaving iCarly, and in the end, this one just feels like another pointless filler episode. Okay, so we have now officially reached the midpoint of the final iCarly series. Season. At this point, the show took a very brief four-month hiatus, but when it returned, commercials curiously advertised the remaining episodes as the beginning of the final season of the show, which implies that these remaining episodes are actually iCarly Season 7. I don't look at it this way, I consider the rest of these episodes to be iCarly Season 6 Part 2. But as a kind of mock mini intermission, I thought it would be fitting if we kind of stopped here and I told you basically everything that I've forgotten to talk about up to this point. If I was like, okay, here's everything I haven't mentioned yet, we're just gonna stop and, and, and bring it all up right here. Okay, thing I forgot to mention, number one, Socko. There's this ongoing running joke in the series where characters will constantly point out that Spencer doesn't seem to have, like, adult friends, and he only really hangs out with teenagers. But there are two main exceptions to this. The first exception is that we find out at the end of Season 4 and then again at the beginning of Season 5 that Spencer has a group of, like, closely-knit female friends that he only meets, meets with 
uh, when Carly is at school and he has a book club with these women and he has uh, a baking club with these women. And uniquely out of character for him, he's not trying to sleep with any of these women. He just enjoys like meeting up with them and discussing romance novels and that kind of thing. And this is brought up entirely as kind of a joke so that the other characters can, you know, demasculate him, accuse him of being effeminate because he goes to a book club and so and so and such and such. See you all at Judy's next week. You're coming to the baby shower, right? Yes. What's happened to you, man? But for almost any other episode of the show, the strictly followed canon is that Spencer only has one adult friend, and that is Sako. Sako is Spencer's friend who has a sock company that he often is seen speaking to, and he never appears on screen, but whenever Spencer is talking to someone slightly off screen, or he's having a phone conversation with someone, or he mentions someone in his life, Sako is almost always the person that is being brought up or is being spoken to off screen. Spencer, did you make this cake? Yeah! It's for Sako. See, since he owns his own sock company, I made his birthday cake in the shape of a sock. But arguably the most memorable aspect of Sako is his extended family. There's this very long, consistently followed running joke where Spencer will, f will call upon the family of Sako to do various tasks. And the joke is that Sako has all these weird extended family members who all specialize in different crafts and different trades. And every single one of those people also has a pun attached to their name. For instance, Bernie, who works in torches, Tyler, who sells ties, Otto, who sells cars, Boomer, who works in explosives, and my absolute favorite, Rob, who steals things. A whole lot of the stuff that I wanted to cover in this video that I didn't comes from season one, because back when I was doing season one, I envisioned this as being a much smaller project, and I had this plan where at the end I was going to do a short follow-up that I was going to call the iCarly Iceberg, because that would be funny to write it that way. But by the time I was halfway through season two, I was like, this is going to be so big, I need to include everything. So in short, there's a bunch of stuff in season one that I should have like covered in, de in depth that I didn't because I was saving it for like an add-on video that I'm never going to make. One of the big episodes that I feel like people were probably upset that I kind of glanced over was the cop episode. Um, there's this episode in season one where the police like commandeer the Shea apartment for a stakeout. And it's one of the most memorable episodes of the show, but it didn't really fit with the rest of the show thematically, so I, I barely mentioned it. What's this big spoon for? You ate my sock cake. Why would you eat my sock cake? I don't even know who you are. How could you- I've seen a lot of people say that, like, the cop episode of iCarly is an example of the police violating the Third Amendment of the Constitution, which basically says that, like, in times of peace, uh, you can't force citizens to provide housing for like the military or the police and so on and so forth. I don't think that's actually the case. If you watch the episode, they ask if they can use the apartment as a stakeout and Spencer says yes, because he presumes it's the right thing to do. And after this, they, they totally overstay their welcome and they're complete nuisances. But the only reason they don't get thrown out is because because everyone's like, well, we got to be nice to the police. So it's not like they're being, they like literally come up and are like, we're commandeering this apartment. I see the bag! You think that's our guy? That is definitely our guy! You got the illegal DVD guy? No, the pizza guy! <laughs> we ordered one a half hour ago! Hope you don't mind, man. We used your credit card. <laughs> that episode, the, the entire entertainment value of that one lies in the fact that it's so overtly anti-cop, which is not something you see a lot in kids' shows. You guys, help me get rid of those annoying cops. Yeah, well, maybe you should shut your investigation down. We got a web show here. Stupid cops. Not cleaning up after themselves. Interrupting our web show. I bet we could get evidence quicker than those doof butt cops. One claim I made at the beginning of the last video as a joke was that all of the characters have one parent where we have absolutely no idea what happened to that person, you know. And that's kind of almost true. But as I watched the show, I did piece together a few clues. So for those of you who want to know, it has been confirmed within the show's canon that Freddy has a father. He's not a clone. Freddy has a father. And Sam has a father. She is not a clone. She has a father. I want to say in season two or three, there's this joke where Freddy mentions that he doesn't carry a lot of money because his mom doesn't let him because she's afraid that if he carries enough for bus fare, he'll suddenly leave her. Um... 
And the characters go, well, that's crazy. And Freddy goes, it's not that crazy. And the implication of that joke is that Freddy had a father, but the father hated Freddy's mother so much that he just ran away one day. But the funny thing about Freddy's father and Sam's father is that it's the, it's the exact same story. The only reason we know that these guys, you know, both have fathers is that it's occasionally joked that their fathers hated their mom so much that they just ran away. Where's your father? You tell me! And this is only brought up under the context of punchlines, and it's never even really called upon that these two characters have pretty similar origin stories. It's just like that they both have the same consistent joke that's pulled from when it comes to, like, their moms and their dads. He told me I'm one of a kind. <laughs> yes, and my dad once told my mom he was coming back. <laughs> So moving on. <laughs> One final thing I want to mention about this show, and I really meant to joke about this in the last video, but I just forgot. The entire time that I've been working on this project, okay, that I've been writing all these bits and recording it all, I've constantly had this like sinking fear in the back of my mind that while I'm working on this project, one of these actors is going to get canceled, right? Because, like, I've been working on this project for, for like, nine, ten months now. So it's completely realistic for me to, like, have this long, recorded, written segment where I'm just praising one of these actors to the high heaven. And just when I click post, just when I hit the post button, that actor does something fucking terrible. <laughs> People are going to be mad that I said this, but uh, Gibby's always the one I worry about. Because uh, Gibby's the one in the cast where if he got canceled, you'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. And then you'd go back to making your coffee. You wouldn't even think about it. And, you know, people are going to be really, really upset that I said that. And they're going to be like, why? Why Gibby? Why are you singling him out? OK, L let me explain myself here. Let me explain myself. I have an explanation. Noah Monk is a male Nickelodeon sitcom star who then became... A YouTube gaming comedian, which are the two main categories of milkshake ducks. Statistically, the only way he could be more likely of getting canceled is if he hosted Jeopardy for a week. And again, I'm not saying that he is canceled. I'm not saying I have evidence that he should be canceled. I'm saying it's like one of my fears that he will be canceled and I won't be able to like enjoy Gibby compilations anymore. And like, and I feel that way about the whole cast. I'm, I don't want Jerry Trainer to get canceled. I don't want Nathan Kress to get canceled. I don't want anyone to get canceled. I want all of these actors to never do anything bad so I can continue to enjoy this show that doesn't have a creator. Okay, is there anything else? Something about iCarly that we logically should have talked about, but we haven't. Nope, I got nothing. Okay, let's continue forwards. Season 6, Episode 7 aired on October the 7th, 2012. The title is I Shock America, and in short, it is the Jimmy Fallon episode. At the start of the story, Spencer is watching Jimmy Fallon and is laughing hysterically, which is how you know it's fiction. Fallon suddenly name drops iCarly, and Spencer freaks out as he gathers Carly and Freddy and shows it to them. Jimmy Fallon likes iCarly! I know! I, I, I can't believe he watches the show, right? Spencer's date ditches him and instead spends the night with Gibby, who is still underage. Haha, <laughs> molestation! So the group do a tribute to Jimmy Fallon on the iCarly webcast, and Jimmy sees this because he watches the show every week, which explains a lot. Baggles makes a cameo because that's the only supporting actor that they've been able to stop the Disney Channel from stealing. They get a video call request from the real Jimmy Fallon, and it's the real Jimmy Fallon, who invites them to come to New York and be on his show. Tina Fey pops up on the screen and helps him end the call. So they go on Jimmy Fallon and take part in a game where they're supposed to dance until they get a pair of gloves and a hat to fall off. However, Gibby dances too rapidly, and he shows his cock and balls on live TV. As they take a commercial break, Fallon tries to fend off the flack, as the gang try to figure out how they're going to mend things after the show. Spencer can't help but find the whole situation funny, with everyone else thinking it's the most serious thing to ever happen to them. They do a live stream the next day, telling the audience not to blame Fallon because it was all their fault. That morning, they have a meeting with the FCC, who tell them that they're being fined 5 
$500,000. They initially were going to find Fallon before they saw the iCarly livestream. And if iCarly can't pay, the FCC will shut down the iCarly webcast. Afterwards, they have a meeting at the restaurant from Seinfeld, which is funny, I guess. Then Spencer does a Kramer entrance, which is funny, I guess. Gibby then says that he once pooped in a litter box, which is... What? They think they can't raise the money, but they're invited on Fallon again as a surprise. He reveals that the previous night, he tweeted that anyone who has spare change should stop by, leading to mothers and children swinging by the station to give any pocket change that they have. And because of this, they've raised $576,000, meaning that they can keep their web show. Season 6, Episode 8 is called I Get Banned, and is the last episode wholly themed around Tebow. In the story, Tebow suddenly comes over to the Shea apartment doing antics that the writers used to give to Spencer. He shoots a lemon at Carly's boyfriend and knocks him out, and then rushes out of the room when he's called out on it. Later, at the groovy smoothie, Carly sees Tebow wearing her t-shirt, which he says that he took from her bedroom when she was away from the apartment. They then leave with the smoothies they just ordered, but when he tries to get Sam to pay, she uses a Jedi mind trick on him, down to telling him that these aren't the droids he's looking for. I'm adding that to the list. Tebow comes over in the middle of the night and watches a movie in the Shea household about a Jamaican astronaut. It's called Man on the Moon. Carly is finally over his disrespect for their privacy, and so she bans Tebow from the apartment, saying that he is no longer allowed to visit their home. Spencer comes out, and Carly says that he always sleeps through stuff that's happening. No, I woke up heard foreigners and tried to call the cops. Strangely, Carly comes in the next day to the groovy smoothie, at which point she's told that she's banned from the location. Meanwhile, Gibby and Freddy find out that girls are really into bands and will date people who are in one even if they're ugly. They thus start a fake band only to meet girls, but when Sam finds out, she books them a real gig and they're forced to perform. Tebow calls Spencer's ass the next day, and says that he only stops by so often to get away from the Bensons. Carly says that he must be over-exaggerating on how bad it is, causing him to say that if she can live one night with the pair, he'll stop randomly stopping by, and she'll be on band from the groovy smoothie. Okay, so the first thing we learn in this segment is that Mrs. Benson weighs all of her food. Wait for it, it gets weird. She weighs all of her food, then weighs her poop. She poops on a scale and then uses that to decide how much nutrition the food has given her body. I asked you guys, I said, I said, don't make me watch anymore of this show and you made me keep watching. Why did you do this to me? <laughs> Long story short, after a midnight fire drill, Carly says she understands, and he can come by any time. Tebow says he'll see her at the groovy smoothie, Gibby punches Freddy unconscious during their performance, and I go take a hot bath to try and unlearn all this project has taught me. So let's go ahead and go through episode 9, beat by beat. In the intro to the story, we see a skit where Gibby and Baggles get married. Because yeah, sure, let's keep literally milking the yogurt bag. Afterwards, we see Freddy and Sam hanging out downstairs. Sam is demonstrating an amazing talent she has. She can place a chicken wing inside her mouth and then remove everything but the bone with only her tongue and the inside of her mouth. Yeah, I'm not touching that one. We find out that Carly is planning Spencer's birthday party and is trying to think of a list of people to invite. The group go through a long series of continuity checkpoints, noting that Sako is in safari with his cousin Hunter, Spencer is currently fighting with Tebow over the pronunciation of a word, and Spencer was apparently kicked out of his book club after accidentally setting a box of books on fire. What book were they reading? Fahrenheit 451. <laughs> it's pronounced Fahrenheit. Give me! Spencer gets home from playing tennis with a friend, notes that his tool got all floppy, and the gang asks him which friend he was hanging out with, to which we, oh no, oh, oh, Spencer, that's just weird, man! Oof. I, Carly? More like, I, caramba. 
So the gang decide they're going to find Spencer friends his own age, and they go about finding people in totally normal ways. Looking in men's changing rooms and men's bathrooms, because when you're looking for friends, open nudity is the right place to start. Spencer ends up meeting with several of the friends the gang picked out for him, and the trio meet at a diner and watch this from across the room. Freddy makes fun of a waiter who is slow and has a weird voice, and the waiter overhears this and says that he's going to get Freddy's food first. Sam says that the waiter is going to do something to his food, something which he says isn't likely. Although a brief glance from the man in question seems to confirm that he is indeed about to go do something to Freddy's food. Meanwhile, Spencer hates his new friends, finding that they talk about nothing but politics, tax laws, and theater. He constantly tries to over-adjust to his inability to make an impression, loudly changing the conversation to nerdy franchises and other other tangents. Eventually, the waiter returns with Freddy's fries, and the manager of the location calls him out for going into a back alley for several minutes with a customer's plate of fries. I can only think of one thing that this man would have been doing for several minutes in a back alley with Freddy's food. Through a bit of confusion, Freddy's plate of fries end up being delivered to Spencer's table, but all of the men deny him any of the food, and he runs back to his teenage friends who love and support him unconditionally. Suddenly, Emma Stone shows up, what? And yeah, Emma Stone recognizes the iCarly gang and begins freaking out, only getting louder and weirder as she takes Parafone selfies with all of them, screen crusts included, and even runs into the men's bathroom to meet Gibby, where she touches his meatballs. These chili fries, they taste weird. I, I don't feel so good. Meanwhile, all of Spencer's fake friends get their comeuppance and begin vomiting up the fries. Comeuppance, do you get it? It's good. Spencer has his birthday, and they celebrate with a giant spaghetti taco, and also Jamaican laser tag. Man, I wonder why Tebow isn't in this one. I, I can't think of a reason why the actor wouldn't have, uh, wouldn't have said yes to this. Shoot like a woman! Your laser me nose! Real talk, real talk. Can we just take a moment to recover from the cum fries? I'm just, I'm just, let's all breathe. <sighs> Sometimes when you're this far in, you lose context. It all just becomes noise. So I want to make sure that we stop here and we just say, what the fuck, man? Episode 10 is called I Rescue Carly and is all about one of Sam's old friends from Juvie suddenly getting out and Carly really wanting to befriend her despite being Carly. You know, there's something to be said about how the in-universe lore of this show has warped over time. Like, in seasons 1 and 2, I was under the impression that it's certainly stated that Sam hasn't been to Juvie. In fact, in the Christmas special, Sam being in Juvie was seen as some kind of Elseworlds bad ending that Carly could have prevented. But when Jeanette McCurdy got sick in season 3, Juvie was the excuse they came up with for the episode. And ever since then, the character has always been stated as a seasoned veteran of the juvenile court. Anyways, we meet Sam's friend from Juvie, who is recently gotten out and announces that she's going to be holding a smash party, which is not what you would think it is. A smash party is a get-together where several ex-Juvie kids go into an abandoned house and smash everything inside. Strangely enough, Carly is really into this idea and insists on being there, while privately Sam's prison friend mocks Carly behind her back. Something just clicked about why I don't like the new transitions. The old transitions were like someone clicking on stuff in Windows Movie Maker, which makes it feel like something that a YouTuber would have used back in the day. And the new transitions feel like an editing timeline that is specifically editing the episode itself. Thus making it feel like we're not watching Freddy going through his files like before, we're watching someone at Nickelodeon edit the sitcom. So in the B-plot, Spencer reveals that he has found an old pair of night vision goggles, allowing him to tickle people in the dark. Alright, Gibby takes his shirt off the first time that he's done this since Season 3. You know, I was confident that nudity was the thing missing from iCarly, but somehow this still doesn't feel right.
Sam says that she doesn't intend on going to the smash party because she doesn't think that they're really wanted there. Carly says she's going anyways, and Sam thinks she's joking. Carly really does go, but immediately feels unsafe, and asks Freddy to come and escort her away from the party. The rowdy gang stop Freddy, Carly, and Gibby from leaving, tying them up against the wall and throwing dishes in their general direction. Sam suddenly learns where they are and bursts into the room. You come here to do some random dancing with your little iCarly friends? Wow, she really does watch iCarly. <laughs> She pulls out her butter sock and asks if the rowdy gang can see very well in the dark. As she dims the lights, she begins kicking ass, and within 30 seconds, no one is left standing. Sam has saved her friends and also Gibby, and agrees to go skirt shopping with Carly the next day. Okay, so this next episode is one that's exciting for me personally, because it's the very episode that led to this miniseries existing in the first place. Season 6, Episode 11, I Lost My Head in Vegas. The iCarly Pawn Stars crossover, which first made me consider the idea of reevaluating this show over a year ago. At the start of the episode, during the iCarly webcast, Sam gets a text on her phone and learns that her mother has been arrested in Vegas and needs to be bailed out of prison. She runs out of the room and the web show ends. Meanwhile, Gibby has eaten an entire bag of sugar for a bit and begins tweaking, and Freddy supports him through this because he is a good friend. Sam finds out her family lawyer can't get her mom out of jail until Monday, and so they ask Spencer to borrow Sako's RV again and drive them across the country to Las Vegas. They don't have nearly enough money to bail Mrs. Puckett out, so they bring a bunch of stuff from their apartments to try and sell at a pawn store, and Gibby brings his head because it's never been to Vegas before. And yeah, the store they go to is the one from Pawn Stars. What an epic le meme. Most everything they've brought is useless and worthless, and for the most part they fail to even make a sale. Gibby and Chum Lee meet and briefly bond over the fact that they're basically the same character. Is there something wrong with your brain? Yeah. <laughs> Yours? Yeah. Chum Lee suddenly blurts out that Gibby's pants are vintage and valuable, and he asks him to join him in the back room. Based on Chum Lee's prison record, I think this is another Gibby gets molested moment. Carly and Sam try to sell a bottle of water, which Michelle Obama half finished when she was on the show. So if I took a sip of this, you'd be swallowing the first lady's DNA. <laughs> nice. Rick agrees to buy the bottle for $2,500, the exact amount they need to bail Mrs. Benson out of prison. Gibby wakes up and announces that he has sold his pants. 200 bucks, and he gave me this chumley flavored lollipop. <laughs> Fun fact, Chumley actually did have a candy store in the real world. It was a drug front. Gibby stuffs all of his money into his head bag and says he's going back to the RV. But first, Chumley says he'll give Gibby some replacement pants. The gang get a text saying that they need to bail Sam's mom out of prison by midnight, and they run off, unknowingly leaving Gibby behind. Hey, what? Want to drink some of the First Lady's DNA? Heck <laughs> yeah. Give me that. They just had to retroactively make the Michelle Obama episode weird. Freddy, Sam, Carly, and Spencer run off to the prison, realize they forgot Gibby, and rush back. But by that time, Gibby has been robbed by an expert con man. However, a Japanese man and his daughter approach the counter and offer to buy Gibby's head from him for $10,000. Gibby says no, but Sam knocks him out, and they accept the offer and make it back to the RV. The man says he intends to take it back to his home country, but I presume he eventually ends up in New York and loses it on the subway where it sits during the first season of Game Shakers just three years later. Anyways, season six, episode 12 is the next to last episode of the show, and boy does it start fucking weird. On the iCarly web show, the gang present a skit on what they would be like if they were animated, and it's South Park. They, they show a South Park fan animation based on iCarly. Sam bursts into the Shea apartment, but finds the fridge is empty, so she begins eating Freddy instead. Carly makes Sam vomit his hand back up and glues it back on, but Sam bites his other hand off in retaliation. They then sing a song about how this isn't a nice thing to do. 
Okay, back in the live action segment of the webcast, they have a bunch of guys come on and sing a song about spaghetti tacos, but it turns out they're all homeless and Carly kicks them back onto the street once the show is over. Sam begins freaking out because she's lost her laptop, which she says is the only nice thing she owns, as it was a bat mitzvah gift from her grandmother. Freddy says that she's not even Jewish, and Sam says that she told her grandmother she was to get free gifts. A moment clearly written into the show to awkwardly staple over the massive continuity issue that the writers have made in the last few seasons. I wonder what Spencer is up to in this B-plot. I was a gamer! That's nice. Freddy eventually realizes that if they can find Sam's serial number, they can remotely view her front camera, and they say that the laptop was stolen by an old woman, who they begin spying on to figure out where she is. Meanwhile, Gibby does some really unfunny shit. Spencer wants to win a big plushie at Chuck E. Cheese or whatever, so he brings Guppy along. Guppy being Gibby's little brother that you'll remember primarily from season three. I gotta pee! You can pee in the ball pit! Yes! Spencer plays all of the games at Gaddy Town really well while Guppy reads a porn book and has something awoken inside of him. Spencer wins the plushie he wants and then they get to leave Freddy Frazbear's and go get Guppy a massage or something. Back in the A-plot, they figure out where this old woman is and Sam breaks down the door and and confronts her. However, Freddy notices that the laptop doesn't look like hers, and they figured out that Sam scribbled her serial number down awkwardly. Freddy tries to apologize, but is hit in the balls, and they all leave. You, uh, you might want to call a door guy. <laughs> oh, scumbags! Ha, <laughs> she said the thing. Sam opens a pizza she left in the Shea fridge a few days before, and lo and behold, that's her laptop. What a classic. Okay, so we have just looked at Season 6, Episode 12, and that means that the next episode is Season 6, Episode 13. And for those of you who don't know, that is I Goodbye, the final episode in the show's original run. Now, obviously, I want to end this video on the final episode, so what we're going to do now is kind of an end-of-season recap, then the eye crimes, and then the finale. Basically what we did with the last video. Season 6 is awful. It's not good. <laughs> This season really feels like they're throwing everything at the wall and hoping that something sticks. Some episodes feel like tributes to the early seasons that kind of recapture the energy, and others feel like pale imitations that are just underwhelming, and some other episodes are just kind of non sequiturs. I think the April Fool's episode really set the tone for this season, because leaving that behind, you expect there to be a notable difference between that and the final 12 episodes of the show. But there's kind of not. The show has become so much of a parody of itself that it feels closer to a literal parody of itself than it does to the first three seasons. I'm really glad that I saw that Game Shakers episode, by the way, because it, it's so telling to me that the creators of this show had the chance to illustrate iCarly fans watching the best moments of the show, and almost all of what they picked from was seasons 4, 5, and 6. They had these kids watch some of the most underwhelming iCarly material ever put to screen because in their minds, that's when this show was great. And you see this often in marketing material. That image of Gibby holding up a duplicate of his own head is very often used as a representation of what the show was about, as if that's the funniest joke in the world, when really it's kind of bad. And that's why iCarly being so self-obsessed doesn't really work for me, because it's like, oh, well, this material is good because iCarly is good, iCarly is great. But iCarly isn't great. iCarly sucks, because you guys are doing a bad job of running the show. I want to clarify something, by the way. Towards the beginning of this video, I mentioned that in Season 4, a bunch of people working on this show left to work on Victorious. But I never mentioned that by the beginning of Season 5, pretty much all of those people had come back. Which is confusing to me, because it really feels like there was someone working on iCarly at the very beginning who got the show, and that anchoring perspective is missing by the end. But who could have possibly left, because like all the same people were working on the show by the end? One thing you've probably noticed by now is that the writers of the show responded to the shorter season orders and the expanded cast by not only having A plots and B plots, 
but also C plots and D plots and E plots and F plots. A lot of F plots. And what this means is even in episodes which have stuff that are good, you don't get to really appreciate that material because it's like four minutes of stuff. Like, the Firefighters B-plot is so promising, but it's just barely there because it's one of four storylines in a 22-minute episode. So even though it's funny, they don't get to explore it because they had to make time for a Gibby joke that's just kind of weird and mean. I will say, out of the last three seasons, the Jimmy Fallon episode is the best one. Because it's a full story. They don't pussy out. They don't end the storyline early and make a fourth wall joke. They don't do a throwback to season two and have that be the solution. Gibby shows America his cock and balls. And the rest of the episode is a realistic exploration of the repercussions of that. So to me, Gibby showing America his cock and balls is part of the golden era of the show. I think the main saving grace of these final seasons is Tebow. And the thing is, I don't think Tebow is written very well by the end. He basically just becomes Discount Spencer. But the, the Tebow episodes really became the material that I looked forward to by the end more than anything else. I mean, the Tebow storyline in Season 5 works better than the SETI storyline, and that's something I never thought I'd be saying. And as we move on towards the final episode, I'm curious how they're going to set us up back on track, and how they could possibly make this a satisfying finale. But before we do that, let's quickly recap the I Crimes of Season 6. Now, I realized while editing this video that I accidentally made a little bit of an error back in Season 4, when I accidentally counted one crime two times, and instead of having to go back and re-record every single iCrime soundbite, I figured it'd be easier if we just went back to the last crime number and re we repeated that one again. And that was iCrime number... 54? We're in the mid-50s? So we'll be skipping Season 6, Episode 1 on a pretty big technicality. The fact that it's clearly not intended to be part of the regular canon. I know it's tempting to count Gibby assaulting random people with a stop sign as individual crimes, but it's just too vague of an area for me. I feel like if we start counting stuff like this, next thing we know we're gonna be counting cartoon cannibalism as well. Anyways, in Season 6, Episode 2, the band One Direction performs on iCarly. At the beginning of the episode, Sam briefly hits on Zane, and towards the end, after their performance is over, she is seen putting him into a chokehold and dragging him to the elevator, laughing as he yells for help. The implication of this moment is that Sam intends to sexually assault Zane despite him turning down her advances, which is funny because he's a guy. And that's I Crime number 54. Maybe Sam should be in jail. Like, maybe that would make the world a safer place. I Crime number 55 is Gibby opening an illegal restaurant inside the basement of his school. I Crime number 56 is Sam beating a fellow student with a pound of butter, breaking his arm. I Crime number 57 is Gibby shoving people into his armpits. I'm not actually sure if this is a crime, but it's on my list. I Crime number 58 is development of an unregulated laser device that ultimately overloads, blows up, and causes property damage and potentially bodily harm to a child. I Crime number 59 is Gibby showing 4 million Americans his cock and balls on live TV. Now let's talk about stuff we haven't so far. In episode 9, the iCarly Quartet try to find Spencer friends, looking in several discreet places to meet men. Gibby ends up looking in a men's restroom, where he looms over a stall as a man uses the toilet, trying to convince him to befriend Spencer. That's iCrime number 60. Gibby then helps another man dry his hands and is given a tip, as he has been incorrectly identified as the men's room attendant. Seeing how much money he makes, he then permanently sets up shop in the bathroom, impersonating a restaurant employee and haggling money out of patrons and small children. He even sets up a cooking station for meatballs, essentially feeding to visitors meatballs which are coated in fecal matter. I'm going to call this I Crimes number 61 and 62 because there's so many levels to this one and it's just nasty. In the next to last episode of the show, Sam loses her laptop and trashes the Shea apartment looking for it. 
She then throws a lunchbox at Spencer, briefly knocking him out. She then goes to Freddy's place to look, despite the fact that she surely never goes there, and bursts down the door, ripping the place to shreds. She additionally physically assaults Mrs. Benson, telling Freddy that he'd better go over with bandages and a mop, implying that she is now bleeding to death. I feel like there's definitely four crimes in that paragraph, so let's go ahead and call this I crime number 66. Sam then commandeers the groovy smoothie, trashing the place and physically threatening everyone inside, causing a bunch of cops to run away in fear. That's I crime number 67. And of course, in the end, they break down the door of an innocent old woman and threaten her, making that I crime number 68. So yeah, 68 crimes. Wait. Wait, it doesn't feel right to stop there. Eh, what are you gonna do? iCarly Season 6, Episode 13 is yet another double-length episode, running around 44 minutes as opposed to the regular 22. However, what's interesting is that the separate halves of this episode don't really tell one singular story, and indeed, each half really has a different purpose in existing. The final 22 minutes are indeed dedicated to creating a somewhat satisfying conclusion to these characters and this universe, but the first 22 minutes are dedicated entirely to setting up potential spin-offs which were being considered at the time, and this includes the meticulous setup for an iCarly spin-off which was never greenlit and does not exist. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. Oh, that's good decaf. So at the beginning of this episode, Carly, Sam, and Freddy are hanging out at school, and after Sam shows off a back scratcher she made out of a board and nails, Freddy shows off his new phone, the ridiculously oversized MaxPad. Get it? MaxPad? Freddy's a girl, that's the joke. Freddy gets yelled at by Miss Briggs, in a very brief cameo meant to be an homage to the early seasons. Incidentally, in the background of the scene, we can barely make out an image of Miss Briggs photoshopped onto an animal. This is the very image that Carly was sent to the detention office for posting around school, way back in the first scene of the pilot episode. Carly gets an email from her father saying that he won't be able to make it to the annual father-daughter Air Force dance that Saturday. Carly is bummed about this because this is the last year she'll be able to go, I presume meaning that she's 17 in this episode. Meanwhile, in the B-plot, Spencer is repairing a motorcycle for Sako, who is going to give it to his cousin Ryder as a birthday present. Sam enthusiastically joins in on the project, as this very motorcycle is the one that she's dreamed of having since she was a little girl. Gibby sees the motorcycle and thinks it's an exercise machine, a very weird throwback to the time that he thought an exercise machine was a motorcycle way back in Season 6, Episode 2. At that same moment, Spencer gets a call from Audrey, an ex-girlfriend he met in law school, who is the only woman he's ever really loved. She's going to have a layover in Seattle that Saturday, and they're going to meet up and have dinner at the airport. Something that truly excites Spencer. However, when he learns that Carly is upset over missing her final father-daughter Air Force dance, he offers to take her himself, meaning he'll have to cancel this date with his ex. Lubert arrives with a package meant for Spencer, containing an important part he needs for the motorcycle. And Lubert sneezes in Spencer's mouth. Spencer quickly realizes that the parts company has shipped the wrong piece, and to make matters worse, he wakes up the next day deathly sick from Lubert's mouth germs. Sam takes over repairing the bike, working overnight and haggling the missing piece from a local mechanic who doesn't have a face. I don't get it either. Gibby goes to get his head replicated again after his original duplicate was sold in Vegas. He brings Freddy along, and they have a negative encounter with the store owner, who is repeatedly cruel to his pet weasel. However, Gibby allows himself to be strapped into the 3D scanner, only for it to suddenly lock while he's inside, meaning that he's totally trapped in the machine. Freddy buys a phone case that looks like a purse, but quickly rushes over to help Gibby. Carly prepares to go to the dance, but Spencer is so ill that he nearly falls over dead. He gets some rest and soon wakes up better, but it's clear that he won't be taking Carly to the dance after all. Sam calls Freddy and says they need to talk about something important, causing Freddy to think that they're getting back together. 
They quickly and awkwardly shelve the conversation for another day, and Freddy agrees to help cheer Carly up once rescue employees have freed the Gibster. Gibby is eventually freed and is given his duplicate head, with the owner saying that he's not going to charge him for anything. Gibby, unsatisfied, insists that he be given the pet weasel, and the owner obliges, setting up a Gibby spin-off which does not exist. Spencer, feeling a little bit better, relays the news that Socko no longer needs his motorcycle, as he and Ryder got into a huge fight. Spencer has thus essentially been been given the bike, and he decides to give it to Sam, which she graciously accepts. Gibby and Freddy arrive, donning tuxes, and invite Carly to join them at the dance, which only makes her cry more. She says that she just wants the night to end, and doesn't want anyone to take her to the dance. Until, at that exact moment, her father suddenly arrives. Yes, Colonel Shea has secretly arrived in Seattle, and he's here to take Carly to the big dance. They go, and after the commercial break, they arrive home to a random hat party taking place. A throwback to the pilot, and Carly tries to think of all the exciting things they can do while her father is back in town. However, the Colonel has some bad news. He's only in town for that one night, and in just under five hours, he'll be returning to the military base where he's stationed in Italy. That's just enough time to watch the first iCarly video I did. Carly says that she wishes she could spend more time with him, and her father says that she still can, if she comes with him and lives on the military base in Florence. It'll be a great learning experience in a beautiful community overseas, and it'll be a great way to kick off her adult life. But going means that she'll have to leave behind everyone she knows, as well as end the iCarly web show. However, everyone says that it's a great opportunity, and that she has to take it. And so, they broadcast an unplanned special episode of iCarly, the final to exist, where they do throwbacks to all of their greatest bits. Baby Spencer, the idiot farm girl and cowboy, you know, all the bits from season two, because they didn't have any stuff after that that was good. Okay, so two quick comments that I want to actually make about Colonel Shea. Firstly, I want to mention um, a final iCarly fan theory. Um, this is one I came up with a while ago. In fact, while I was working on the previous video, it was something that I just thought of that suddenly came to my head. And I, I, no matter what, I've never been able to properly discount the theory. And so it's always remained kind of partially canon, like in the back of my head. So here it is. Okay, basically the entire basis of this theory, the entire basis here is that because iCarly's father is so mysterious and he's always avoiding meeting with them and it's never, there's always some excuse that he's not in town, I came to the conclusion that he was hiding something from Spencer and Carly. And so the fan theory that I came up with is that Colonel Shea secretly has a second family. Now, I have no evidence of this whatsoever, and if you think about it for two seconds, one, two, it kinda doesn't make sense, but I still choose to believe in that. Second of all, I want to apologize for something. Back when I was working on the script for the first video, I wrote this long bit, kind of asking how Spencer can afford this apartment, because it's a really great place, and I had a handful of people be like, well, I always figured that his military father just sent him a ridiculous amount of cash. And I had a couple people comment that on the original video as well, but I always discounted that because there was no canon evidence that I could find, there was no details about that on, like, the iCarly wiki. And so, you know, I just put it to the side. Long story short, this episode directly confirms that that is indeed where Spencer gets all of his money. It's directly confirmed that Spencer's father paid for the entirety of his law school tuition, despite the fact that Spencer dropped out after a few days, and also the fact that Spencer's father still sends him money, es essentially monthly. So there you go, mystery solved, kind of. I stand by the fact that I do not think this was the intended canon in Season 1. I think the intended canon in Season 1 was that he was an artist who sold his sculptures and made a modest living off of that, enough to afford an apartment despite how ridiculous that is, and I think this whole aspect that, you know, he needed to have money sent to him was created in the minds of the writers when they got bored of the storyline aspect of him being a dedicated artist and instead had him just be a comedic 
you know, exaggerated sitcom wacky dude who had no means of making any money whatsoever and had completely forgotten that he made sculptures in the first place. And at that point, you know, every joke about the character became that, you know, Spencer, when are you going to get a real job? Spencer, when are you going to become employed? Because they had basically completely abandoned the aspect that he was a potential up-and-coming artist in the Seattle area that had a lot of talent. Anyways, back to the sappy finale. So they wrap up the final iCarly webcast, and Sam and Carly tell the audience that this isn't goodbye forever, because iCarly will return one day. It's merely inevitable. Carly packs with Spencer and tells him that he was truly a great parental figure, and that he taught her that growing up doesn't mean she has to stop being silly or creative. They hug, and I cry a little. Carly goes upstairs, where Freddy is taking the iCarly set down, and what the fuck are you doing, Freddy? What the fuck is that? You took the fucking lens cap off your camera, you put the fucking cap protector on it, you don't do that, man! Your fucking shutter's all out in the open, you're getting fucking dust in your goddamn camera, man, you dipshit! Where are you gonna put your fucking camera and lens into storage without the proper fucking protection that both ends need? What fucking filmography club did you go to where you didn't learn that shit, you fucking idiot? Freddy and Carly kiss, oh, how nice. Nice. Sam and Carly have a quiet goodbye in the elevator, and Sam gives her the iCarly sound effects remote, saying that it'll bring laughter or cheer or random dancing whenever she needs it. Carly boards her flight with her father and opens her laptop, where she watches the entire backlog of iCarly.com web content, from the pilot all the way to the finale. Spencer recalls the robot squirrel he built in the pilot, and as he picks it up, it catches on fire. Freddy heads back to his apartment, and also flashing back to the pilot, smiles. And Sam gets on her motorcycle, and drives off into the night. Quick thought. This motorcycle didn't work a few hours before this, and Sam was only gifted the bike right before she started riding it, meaning that surely Sam doesn't have any kind of vehicle insurance, and thus simply shouldn't be driving it at all. So you know what? That makes this our iCrime number 69! Woo! One night, I dreamed a dream. As I was walking along the beach with Gibby, a character from the sitcom iCarly, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints in the sand, one belonging to me, and one to Gibby. After the last scene of my life flashed before me, I looked back at the footprints in the sand. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, especially at the very lowest and saddest times, there was only one set of footprints. This really troubled me, so I asked Gibby about it. Gibby, you said once I decided to follow you, you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints. I don't understand why, when I needed you the most, you would leave me. He whispered, My precious child, I love you, and will never leave you. Never ever, during your trials and testings, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. A 
So, here we are. It has been, I guess, about eight and a half months. And I have finally completed my mission. I have finally watched every single episode of iCarly. Or at least, every episode that existed when I started this project. And you know, I have to say, uh, that's a lot more time than the 100 day estimate that I gave at the start of all this. When you sit down and you talk about a TV show for eight hours straight, you at some point have to start to wonder if there's anything left to say that you haven't said already. And uh, the answer to that quandary is probably no, but I'll try my best. iCarly is a fascinating thing because it's one of the last times that I personally remember buying into an entertainment phenomenon that was based 100% around cable television. To watch iCarly, you had to turn your satellite to a specific station at a specific time and just pray that they would be playing an episode that was actually good. There were no streaming services that had it, you couldn't buy it on Amazon Prime, you had to watch it on TV. And obviously what's interesting about that is that it's also a show about the thing that was about to make cable obsolete. The internet, content stream to your home, the ability to watch whatever you want at your own time and your own convenience. And what's funny is that as the internet gained power, as it took over, and as cable declined, iCarly shifted focus away from being about the internet and started being about itself, as I've said many times, which means that iCarly became a show about cable television at the exact point in time where cable television had started to lose its grasp on the culture. Which ironically means that iCarly episodes from 2008 are far more relevant today than iCarly episodes from 2012. iCarly will always remain a weird comfort for me, but mostly in moderation. <laughs> Never do what I've done. Never binge this whole show, because it, it can get really, really hard to slog through, but, but this time around, I, I, I did find myself appreciating different things than what I remembered as a kid. I mean, I really, really related to Carly by the end of this show. I thought she was just a great character that I really liked being around by the end, and that's not something you can say for every Nickelodeon sitcom that was on around this time. And, you know, even at this show's worst, even at its most flanderized, I still love Spencer, I love Freddy, I love Sam, I love Gibby, I love Tebow, I even love Lubert, you know, a little bit. I mean, these, these characters, they do feel like old friends that I haven't heard from in ages. And when an episode is done well, when it's scripted right, when it's not awful, it can be really fun to check back up on these guys and see what they're up to. Now, as I always end up saying around this point, here's the thing. I'm sure many of you at home are anticipating that this is going to become a transition into the iCarly revival of 2021. I mean, that makes sense. I'm sitting here talking about how I love revisiting these characters and it makes me feel good to see where they are. Surely watching the modern take on the show is the thing I want to do next. And you know, maybe it is, but often reality can be disappointing. Because the idea that iCarly history ends in 2012 and picks back up in 2021 it's a lie that we tell ourselves so we can sleep at night. What is the point in talking about the nostalgia-baiting iCarly revival with an incomplete cast designed to invigorate a failing network without talking about the first time this happened? Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the next piece of iCarly media that we are going to be looking at is not the most recent revival, but the 2013 spin-off, Sam and Cat. However, there's a problem. And it's not exactly a problem that I am happy to report on. How can I binge and review Sam and Cat 
when I'm missing out on half of the context. So next time on Quentin Reviews, I will be reviewing Victorious, iCarly's sister show. This is going to be a really weird branch of this project for me because it's kind of going to be the opposite of iCarly. Because, you know, iCarly and Victorious were both on the air at the same time. I know for a fact that I watched both of these shows. But while with iCarly, I remember 60% of the episodes, <laughs> I don't remember anything about Victorious. I really don't. I mean, I've searched my brain and I've got, I've, I remember that there were 17 cast members. Okay. I remember that I thought it was kind of boring. You know? And that's it. Well, I remember the puppet, but... I don't really need to remember the puppet, because... I see it every time I close my eyes. So yeah, it's looking like this mini-series is going to be a tiny bit longer than most of you guys probably anticipated. I know I was surprised. Um, so you, if you don't want to miss out on the next chapter of this project, I really recommend going down to the description and hitting that subscribe button. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Patreon, Instagram, I have a subreddit. I'll be honest with you guys, I've been having the most awful luck. I've had the most horrible luck. I've lost data, then I sent that data to be sent to a repair place, and FedEx lost the package. So I've just been like depressed and feeling bad and also like kind of caving in under the weight of all the work I've had to put into this video and all the others. So if I get a little bit of love after I post this video, that'll be pretty, that'll be pretty cool. <laughs> you know, I won't shy away from a couple comments telling me that they liked this video. Um, so if you want to send me something like that, you know, you know, hit me up on my socials. That's all I'm trying to say. And one final thing, I actually have, I think, two hours done at the very least, at least two hours done of the Victorious video. And I think it's going to be very long. <laughs> but the point is that I'm hoping by the time I have this posted, I'll mostly have that like polished off. And so if you want to see, wow, if you want to see the first two hours of the Victorious video far before anyone else, uh, support me on Patreon, help me get to those stretch goals, help me get to, you know, the McDonald's trip and the Garfield video game project. And, um, I'll try and get the two-hour edit out in the next few days. Uh, it might already be up, I don't know. With that, I've been Quentin Reviews. And that's all you need.